Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to MBR, or as we like to call it around here, Nothing But Rants, the show where I find topics that I'm oddly passionate about, and I pontificate upon them. These are not hot takes, but rather takes that I'm hot about. Let's shut up and grab some tape. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome into the Film Guy Network on a beautiful Thursday evening. Hey, we got a saying around here when it comes to the end of the week, right? Last show, best show. Hammer it out. It's hours five and six of the quote-unquote off-season slate. And boy, do we have a loaded one for you guys tonight. We got a very special guest, none other than Dan Landing, the head coach of the Oregon Ducks. We're not going to waste any time, whether it be the viewers or uh, this man right here. But first off, Coach, I want to bring you in and tell you thank you for joining us for the second time. Uh, I looked at it today. The last time you were on our network, uh, it was about a month before your very first football game as the head coach of the Oregon Ducks. So first off, thanks for coming back on. Second off, what is the number one thing you've learned in, in, in the time since, in the last 18 months? What is the number one thing you've learned as the head coach of the Oregon Ducks? Man, great to be on with you, Brooks. It's, uh, it's a great question. You know, I've learned that you better keep learning because things are going to change here in college football. Uh, expect the unexpected. You know, that's that's one thing that's certainly come, and uh, I feel like we're a little bit more adaptable and learnable as it happens. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like the, the ground beneath us in college football is always moving, whether it be as a head coach or even as a, as a goofy content creator. It feels like something new is coming around the corner every single day. Um, man, wh when you first took that job out there at Oregon, I think one of your very first moves, I mean, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but one of your very first decisions was like, hey, we're going to go get this Bo Nix guy. I really believe in him. We're going to bring him out to, to Oregon. And all he did was ball out for two years, had career years, back-to-back -back seasons. And then, obviously, you had some coordinator change. But I think what set me off to this next question was what you did this last offseason, Coach, where you bring in Dylan Gabriel and Dante Moore in the same transfer class at a position that, from an outsider's perspective, Coach Lane, it, it's very foreign to you. You're a defensive coordinator, yet as your you know career as a head coach starts off, I would argue you've recruited the quarterback position as well as anybody in the sport. So the question is, as a defensive mind, as a guy who grew up around it on the defensive side of the football, how are you having so much success on the offensive side of the football and recruiting at that position, the most important one? Well, it always starts with proofs in the pudding, right? And we were, we were able to have a lot of success with Bo. He did really well here. I think that's appealing. And, you know, before, long before I ever got to Oregon, there were a lot of quarterbacks that have had success, whether it's Marcus or Justin Herbert. There's been some guys here that have played at a really high level. Yeah. Uh, and what we were able to do with Bo and what Bo, Bo was able to do here, I think, speaks for, uh, speaks for itself. Uh, ultimately, yeah, defensive background. But as a head coach, I've learned you appreciate when your offense scores a lot of points. So um, having, a, having a guy at quarterback, that's where it starts. you got to have a good one to win. Yeah, I guess re recruiting is recruiting to an extent. Relationship building is relationship building. I think Jay Will had something for you, Coach. Yeah, Coach, I got a question for you. So, I mean, Midwest guy, then spent a lot of time down in the South region as well with the multiple programs. Then you go all the way out west to Oregon, some unfamiliar territory as many would deem. And a lot of times when that happens, you know, people want to say, well, you know, he's never had to mainly recruit that region of the country before. That might be something that he has to adapt to. Was that an obstacle that you had to maneuver around, or was that even is it even that big of a deal to kind of have to adjust to something like that? No, I mean, it really doesn't matter. Recruiting's about work, right? And it's really about relationships. You know, it's not necessarily as much about a recruiting pitch or, you know, you're not a, you're not a car salesman. You have to show how you can change and develop lives and how relationships really matter to you. So i uh, been fortunate to be around some of the best in the business to do it. And it's, it's uh, unlike my face right now, it's like shaving. You just got to do it every day or you don't look good. And uh, if you recruit every day, right before I hopped on this call with y'all, we're making recruiting calls and that's what it takes. You want to have a good team. You got to have good players. I, I wonder sometimes coach, if, if this, the, the college ball calendar is something that everybody talks about as a, as, as a contention point in the sport. I wonder how much you guys work 365 days a year because it's your nature. Like I've been around college football coaches most of my life or most of my adult life. And you guys are very much so addicted to this stuff. I don't think you would work 200 days of the calendar year anyways, I think you'd be grinding it out no matter what, wouldn't you? 
you'd find some way to get an advantage. Yeah. Um, and if you're competitive, you're going to try to figure out some way that you can be doing it better than somebody else. And, you know, ultimately, uh, if that's the way, you know, Coach Saban said this uh, a long time ago when I was there, you know, in the NFL, you get the opportunity to go get one first round pick. In college football, you can have as many first round picks as you want if you want to outwork the opponent and recruit. So that's our goal. How many first round picks can we sign? And um, that takes time. That takes, you know, a lot of effort. And I, I think regardless of what the calendar looks like, we're going to figure out a way to have that effort. You know, would it be nice to have a little more balance? Sure. But I don't know. You, you said it. I'm, I'm not the kind of guy that wants to sit around and not do anything either. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not interested in sitting around the crib either. Um, I, I guess, you know, we, we talk about one, one of the biggest like, hey, is this coach going to have sustained success boxes you have to check, in my opinion, in college football is retention, right? You, retention and replacement, particularly on your coaching staff. When you have success, when you win 10, 11, 12 football games, when you're in contention for college football playoff, you know, runs your staff is going to get picked off of it. And you found this your first year as a head football coach. You know, Kenny Dillingham obviously gets hired to be the head coach at Arizona State. And all you managed to do is hire, hire Will Stein, bring him in, a guy from UTSA, and he flat out balls. All you do is improve by almost a full touchdown. So, Coach, I'm, I'm curious. A lot of coaches that I know and study, most of them hire from within whatever connective tree that they have. Hey, I know this guy. I worked with him here. Or I had a buddy that worked with this guy here, and he speaks highly of him. How do you go about your hiring process? Because so far, Coach, you've been hitting home runs. Yeah, I think, you know, it starts with having people that you trust around you and leaning on, you know, people's opinions that you trust and then doing some research. You know, uh, it's not always about the easy hire. It's not always about the sexy hire. It's about the right hire. Um, you know, what, like what, why was Will a great fit? I knew that we wanted to keep a lot of the components of our offense the same. I didn't want to change the scheme dramatically for Bo uh, going into his second year with us. I wanted somebody to work really well with the staff. And that starts with doing some research. And then I want somebody that can bring some additional you know, pieces to the puzzle that I thought we would we could have and add uh, and make us better. So anytime you get an opportunity to hire a coach, for me, I enjoyed that interview process. I enjoy the process of learning about people, digging deep, figuring out what makes them tick and and really more than anything, how they're going to keep the boat rowing in the same direction. Um, and we've been able to do that well here. You know, as long as we're having success, we're going to continue to have coaches that have opportunities. You know, my goal is that they leave for opportunities that are better. And uh, leave for you know I, I'm lucky to be sitting in this chair right and uh, pinch myself every day I hope that I can help other people get to sit in a similar chair um, and when that opportunity comes I hope they're ready for it so that's the goal absolutely prepare them and then send them on their merry way um, you know this is, a, this is a, a delicate question coach I'm gonna do my best here um, a lot of talk nowadays, particularly in the NFL world, we just got done watching the Super Bowl by analytics and, and, and the numbers playing a role in decision-making processes in the, in the game's most critical moments, most importantly, fourth down. Um, how do you go about your decision-making process on those fourth downs? We don't have to talk about specific examples, but I've heard the term, you can't date analytics, you kind of got to be married to them. But I've also heard the idea of like, hey, you know, coaching is kind of like a gut feeling you can say the analytics say this, but what if my left guard is this today? Or what if my, you know, what if we can't get separation today? What if things have changed outside of the numbers? Coach, how do you go about, hey, this is the critical down today. This is the decision to be made. How do you go about making that decision when it's time to be made? Yeah, a lot of it starts in the week, right? And it starts with having confidence in what you're planning on doing on fourth down in those situations, right? How, how uh, successful do you feel like those plays will be that you're going to run if you do decide to go forward on a fourth down? Um, you know, the more confidence you have in that, the more you will lean on your analytics when it gets to those, those moments in the game. And it really impacts more so your third down decision making. Mm. You know, if it's a third and eight and you're saying, hey, we're willing to go for it on three or less, um, and that decision has been made so more on a Tuesday, well, now you feel a lot more comfortable potentially running the ball into a light box on third down mm. uh, because you know that you're going to go for it if it's fourth and one. Um, so, you know, it all plays a part. Um, certainly there's some in-game decision piece that, that's part of that and your success that you've had so far within the game. Are you seeing the looks you anticipated seeing? You know, all that stuff matters. And I'm sure it also matters how you've spoken to your team that week or that season, right? If you're if you've spoken to your team about, hey, we are going to be an aggressive football team, we are going to lay it out on the line, or whatever your message may be, 
if, if that's the deal, then we are who we are. We're going to stay true to who we are in every critical moment. Um, Coach, I'm sure you've been asked the logi logistical question about the Big Ten over and over again. Hey, how are you handling the, the travel from Oregon to potentially Rutgers? And I, I don't think that's as necessarily as big of a deal for you guys being a football program as m more so as like – it's a cultural change. It's a football brand change. There's a different brand of football being played, I would imagine, in the Big Ten than the Pac-12. That's my opinion. So as someone who I'm sure has been spending most of their offseason studying new and future opponents and foreign opponents to the to the Oregon football program, what is your initial you know, uh, reaction to the Big Ten? How do they go about playing football? And is there a different brand of football being played up there? Yeah, we're really excited about it. Um, you know, I think more than anything, affiliating yourself with some other great programs. You look at the national championship game this past year, and you're talking about two Big Ten programs, you know, that are playing in that game. Um, you know, well, the first thing you do, you start diving in and, and evaluating um, really some of these other teams and asking yourself, what personnel groups are you going to be seeing? What are the differences there? And there, there was a lot more alike than I anticipated, to be honest, when you start deepening, like doing a deep dive into the numbers. There's not as much 12 personnel, 21 personnel in college football in general um, as there used to be, you know, and, and especially as there used to be in the Big Ten. You know, there was this perception of what like a team what, like Wisconsin was in the past. And really this past year, there are a lot more 11 personnel. So yeah. there's probably not as many differences when you talk about some of the teams we've played in the past, like an Oregon State or a Utah. Um, now you're going to be seeing some of those teams with, you know, Michigan or an Iowa that's, uh, you know, some bigger personnel package teams. There's probably not as many differences as people anticipate. Um, but that's something we got to figure out and we'll have to figure out quick. And we'll, we're hopping into that. We're still wrapping up some of our self scouts studying on ourselves, but we'll hop into some of these other opponents and what will look different in the future for us moving forward. Yeah, you know, I, I know your background, obviously. And, and I hear these coaches in this conference down here in the Southeast talk about the SEC being a line of scrimmage conference. I, I would argue it's a line of scrimmage sport. And I, and I would argue that, like, you, you, you see programs like Oregon being built based off that. Is that an accurate assumption of your program that, hey, you have to build off the line of scrimmage first? Like, you have to have big dudes that move bodies. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, and I think that the way we've recruited kind of shows that, yeah. that, you know, the front, you have to win in the front. We have to go sign big bodies up front on the defensive and offensive line. And if you want to be a team that can establish the run, you better win up front. Um, and that'll, that'll be a part of our culture as long as I'm here, that you can win games there. It doesn't matter what your skill looks like uh, if your quarterback's on his back, right? And it doesn't matter what your skill looks like um, or your running back looks like if he doesn't have somebody who can move piles up front. So um, all that matters. And the quickest way you can, you know, hide a deficiency somewhere else is to have a good offensive or defensive line. So mm. we want to recruit well there. I think that's winning football regardless of conference. Yeah, that's, that's universal, as they would say. Coach, man, I, I see you doing interviews. I see you all over the place doing interviews. I know you work your butt off on the recruiting trail. The results prove that. I know you work your butt off coaching football. The results prove that. I, I, I want to know how do you have the time and energy? Those are the two. That time and energy to do everything that you do. So if you could boil it down, give me one tip for each. I need a tip for time management from Coach Dan Landing, and I need a tip for that juice. How, what are you doing? How, how do we go about being the most optimal versions of ourselves in those two categories? You love what you do, right? Like, it doesn't feel like I'm going to work when I get up in the morning. Like, I'm going to have some fun. You know, I enjoy uh, – I really enjoy this part of my job. And I enjoy – right now is a lot of fun. You know, we're not able to go on the road recruiting. So, what are we able to do? Spend some time with our players. Um, watch ball, right? This is something I missed for a while. Because for about two months, you don't get to watch football. You're in and out of uh, hotel rooms and uh, airports and traveling a lot to go see players. Um, but the fact that it does change in college football keeps it exciting. Uh, energy – I guess you could say coffee. I, I drink a lot of coffee. Um, What's but yeah, coffee I mean, take, coach, what, what are we talking like? 800 milligrams of caffeine a day? What, what are we talking about? I don't know, man. I got this Keurig right beside my, my desk and uh, it's busy. Let's just say it's busy. <laughs> I don't really eat much during the day. Like uh, I'll eat, I eat dinner at night. That's kind of my meal, um, which isn't the right way to do it. I know. But um, yeah, I drink a lot of coffee. How many cups? I mean, at least, at least five a day, at least. Oh. Um, that's a lot of caffeine, Coach. That's a lot of caffeine. A good amount. Hey, hey, it is what it is. I, I ain't turning 18-hour shifts in the office. I think Kirby had yeah, something for you. That's insane. Yeah, Coach, <laughs> coach you, play, you play at the NAIA level, so it's obvious that you really do love football. But have being in Division One sports, how have you seen that NIL and Transfer Portal kind of play a factor in affecting those smaller divisions? 
Yeah, I don't know if it's affected places uh, like where I played at William Jewell. Um, I do think what's changed you know, it's affected high school recruiting. And there's some guys that are really good players and uh, some smaller programs feel like maybe they can solve their issues in the portal by signing a, a, a transfer guy. And it's it's maybe taking the guy that was a developmental guy or a guy that was a group of five or a, uh, a D2 or, a, you know, uh, NAIA player and, mm -hmm. and eliminated some of those opportunities because coaches rather take a guy that's in the portal. Um, you know, we still believe in bringing it from the ground up and building it from the ground up. So we still want to go sign high school guys every year and develop guys in our program, but we are going to use the portal to enhance our program too. When you can plug holes, um, create competition, you know, that's something you have to be able to do, but it certainly affected high school recruiting. Uh, I think we all see that guys that are capable of playing at college level, maybe aren't getting as many opportunities because there's so many guys floating out there in the transfer portal. Uh, and sometimes people might see those portal players as good answers and options, but usually if they're, you know, if they're leaving and not getting the opportunities they want, that means they, they probably weren't, you know, you know, in the right spot to start or playing the wrong sport to start. Yeah, it's been a I, th I thought it was a foreseeable impact of the portal and a for very foreseeable impact of the additional COVID year. That's a whole macro discussion, honestly, in the world of recruiting. But I, I think I, I want to take the time here to tell whoever's listening to this that is one of these players that's been overlooked for years that, you know, five years ago might have ended up at Memphis or a caliber program like Memphis and Memphis just took X amount of transfer guys, whatever it is don't be closed off to division two offers anymore. Don't be closed off to what a quote unquote smaller school offers. Cause all it takes nowadays is a massive season at that quote unquote small school. And then these schools that you've been dreaming of will end up calling you. If you go prove that you were quote unquote missed out on. Um, I think that's a, a, a benefit of this. There's now a path for, I mean, I got a shorter helmet here on the desk coach. There's been three or four shorter players that have gone out of that program to major power five football programs just in the last 18 months. So there is a pathway for this. If you're quote unquote slept on, if you're missed on coming out of high school, just go ball, man. It's the answer for everything. Just go be great at what you do. Um, kind of the last question I have for you, coach, and, and it kind of ties into this last serious question. I got a goofy one for you at the end. Um, what is the number one change in college football you would implement? I know that there's a whole lot of talks about, you know, college football commissioners or a super league or whatever. If there was one thing in the in your world as a college football head coach at a major program that you could change, tweak, or alter to make your life a little bit more convenient, what would it be? I think the more you talk about, you know, this game, I, I think we're trending in a direction where it's modeling more and more the NFL game, you yeah. know, in a, lot, in a lot of ways. Um, and one thing that certainly makes it challenging is having two, two opportunities for free agency, you know, during during the year. The, if there was one portal window, I think that makes a lot of sense, yeah. um, you know, to understand who your team is and who you're playing with going into the fall and not having to be uh, revisiting that in April uh, or in the spring. But I also think the players deserve to have, uh, an opportunity to move. So I don't know. I don't know if I have all the answers um, to fix that because as long as coaches are able to, to move, players deserve that same right to be able to move as well. <laughs> so, so my answer is adapt. <laughs> you know, yeah. just figure it out, and then we'll figure out the rules. I would. I would be in favor of before we change a lot of rules, before we make the next change, we better think about the repercussions because I don't know if that's been done. You know, uh, in a lot of these decisions that are made with college ball. Yeah, a lot of a lot of flying by the seat of the pants as of lately. It's felt like from from the decision makers around the game of college football. All right, seriously, last question here for you, Coach. Um, I noticed when you this is way back. I noticed when you first took the job at Oregon and they did that little basketball event where you came out at halftime and they introduced you. Hey, head football coach of the University of Oregon. Here is Dan Lanning, and here comes Dan Lanning coming out of the tunnel. And Dan Lanning's got a pair of Jordan 3s on that are, like, real clunky, like real big Jordan 3s, like all Jordan 3s. As a sneakerhead myself, I have avoided these. Now, I have noticed, Coach, that you have slightly shifted more towards an Air Max man at this Nike school that you coach at. And I'm judging based off your height, you wear about a size 12. So, it's a long way of asking, what's going on with all them Js, and can I hold some? 13s. Um, See, 12 and a half. So not I was too far say away. You can wear a couple pairs of socks. You know, I have more pair of shoes now than I ever thought any grown man should ever have. And so really what's happening here is we cycle. You know, we we kind of we kind of change shoes day to day. Uh, I still wear the Jays uh, quite a bit. Um, but, yeah, I, I try to, you know, try out different ones pretty frequently, which is something I never thought I'd say about myself, but I enjoy it. Yeah, you come from a, you come from a program at your last stop that was – 
keep the main thing the main thing. And now you're up there at Oregon with how many? 215 uniform combinations? How many they got? They got a bunch up there. Hey, infinite. Coach. Yeah, infinite. Coach, I, I am very appreciative of your time, man. You do not have to do this for this little YouTube channel, and I'm thankful for you joining us today, man. Appreciate you, Brooks, man. You guys have a good one. Thanks no for doubt. having We'll me. talk to you soon, Coach. Hey, that boy Dan Lanning. Give him three. <laughs> good little interview with the head coach of the Oregon Ducks, huh, pals? Hell yeah, dude. That was sick. That's yeah. a good dude right there, man. Oh, yeah. um, doesn't have to do all the things that he does for the media um, and does so anyways. A, a relentless ball of energy at all times. Um, well, I, I understand that why now. Yeah. Holy shit. Nuts, right? <laughs> Ooh. Five cups? Ooh. Bro, I'm trying to uh, – so we assume the modern Keurig cup's about 180 to 200 milli vanillis really? per, per press. I always thought a standard cup of coffee was like 80. Yeah, well, well we talking about he, – he said he got an espresso machine up in there, right? It was a Keurig, He, he yeah. got the Keurig. Yeah. So if it's a Keurig, eh, it's, he might be under 600 milligrams a day. But that that would be – you know, I'm, that's, that's kind of my threshold. I'm not trying to – I think I'm at 400 a day, but I'm not trying to go north – of 600 milligrams of caffeine a day or else my hair stands up naturally you know without the hair gel uh, but yeah shout out to dan lanny man that guy does not have to do that um and he's done so twice on this network dude came on and did an interview a month before that georgia game back in 2022 um and has obviously been tremendously busy since i mean for christ's sake that's a guy that sits on the desk at college game day a month ago and now he's here on this channel so um, I think that A says a lot about him, but B says a lot about this network as well. So, welcome in. We've got a loaded show for you guys tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about the most impactful coaching moves that have gone about in the world of college football. We have a college football video game coming to us this summer. We're going to talk a little bit about that. There's a massive coaching move. Not a massive coaching move. A coaching move that's going to make some impacts around uh, the Southeast in particular. And the SEC is moving to a nine-game schedule per reports. We need to talk about that as well tonight. So welcome, man. Make sure you hit that thumbs-up button, like, subscribe, rate, review. And if you are an Oregon football fan that has found us via the algorithm tonight, welcome in. We talk college football every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday live at 8 o'clock Eastern time. That's 5 p.m. Eastern time for you guys out there uh, on the West Coast. So if you like college football talk, there's no better place to find it then right here uh make sure you hit that thumbs up button like subscribe rate review also make sure you run over to prize picks today prizepicks.com use promo code brooks you get a hundred percent deposit match what does that mean you put up to a hundred dollars you get instantly matched in your account with a hundred free buckaroos over there prizepicks.com use promo code brooks where do you want to start boys i want to start with this college football video game because it oh, seems to be the talk of the town i mean yeah it's like the biggest news in a little while so. by the way that Coors beer hat is hot I love that thing. Oh, you do? Matched yeah. with the with the old school Ford script. You got that shit on tonight, brother. TJ Maxx and Amazon. Yeah, you got that shit on tonight. <laughs> What's up, dog? Do me next. I think that's your high school football program. Yeah. It's yeah. Just the old hoodie. They all right. They all right. They, they got a Michigan Wolverine uh, helmet, right? Yeah. Yeah, they all right. They all right. They had a, a K-State football player on their team this year? Uh, Missouri. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mizzou. Um, White DB. Hey. You got a shot. Mm. Hey. I, I don't know if we don't hey. need to get yeah, into semantics of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't call him white. Yeah, I, I, thinking back on it now, I wouldn't either. Um, so let's go into this college football game before Brooks sticks his foot in his mouth any further. Um, <laughs> it's finally here, okay? It is finally here. The world of college football has, uh, has rejoiced today because uh, EA announced that they will finally be officially releasing – the college football video game this summer. I want your initial thoughts before we get way too far into this stuff. Full reveal is supposed to be set in May, okay, um, with some type of immediate release this summer. Can't come soon enough. That'll be the, uh, that'll be the biggest news of the entire month of May because May is definitely that period of time once you get out of spring practice. It's like, okay, now we're in for the long run. We got to make it through May, June, mm -hmm. July, and a little bit of August as well. So the fact that it's coming in May, that's going to be – Absolutely, it's, it's, I can't wait. Can't wait. At approximately eleven fifteen in the middle of my class today, I had my AirPods in and I was looking at my phone with a fat ass smile on my face because I the, the trailer finally dropped. I I have not been this happy in a long time. Mm. AirPods and, and, and in it's, class, and I'm not at a yeah. I put them in, dude. I had to. I, I had to watch that trailer. Mm. So. You, I, I can't give you shit because you ended up turning right around and writing an article, right? Yeah. Okay, in class. Yeah. All right. 
we'll talk later. But Sorry. I'm in class, no longer an excuse for not being able to write an article, right? Well, this, <laughs> I'll tell you what this class is afterwards, but it, it's it's one I can it's, it's one I okay. can take. I was away. definitely in a class where I could not do that. Yeah, I'll tell you that we much. all have those. I mean, yeah. it's been a, it's been a decade since I've been or a half a decade since I've been in college, but I know those. Oh yeah. I mean, for Christ's sakes, I've told stories on this channel of me and my teammates rotating who is going to say here for all of us in the same class. Um, <laughs> it's a dynamic, dynamic, uh, yeah. not cheating strategy, but skipping uh, class strategy. We recognize second day of class, oh, Buddy does not look up from the computer ever. He mm -hmm. just sits there and reads roll. So, uh, yeah, I got Monday, you got Wednesday, <laughs> yeah. you got Friday. I now have a one-day-a-week class. <laughs> there Shouts you go. out. Um, yeah, so, yeah, there you go. Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm usually <clears throat> – Usually not good. Shout out, shout out. Um, no, nah, it's all good. I was just wanted to give you some shit, <laughs> but um, no, nah, it's a it's a, a tremendous story for college football, um, and a tremendous time burner for a lot of people. This is going to absolutely cook some time. I saw some folks in Discord saying the one thing they asked their wife for was twenty four hours of, of don't mess with me. That's I'm it. I'm going to sit in the hole. Twenty four hours. Well, is dude, not he's married time, with but... children, so there there are responsibilities that we we can't just go hibernate for six freaking months. Twenty four you know hours I mean? is maybe a season and a half of a dynasty. Yeah, I also saw and that's one if you guy, don't stop. Also saw one guy that said he was going to spend seventeen hours developing his own playbook, and I know the guy. Um, he's one of the best followers on Twitter. His name's at Dan Casey or Dan Casey something. Um, tremendous football mind. If you want to know how to just absolutely shred your local rec league as a head football coach, shout out Dan Casey. Um, that man's got some sauce to the playbook. But all right, it's finally here. We'll start with the conversation with where we should always start, which I think we've already had it, but let's rehash it. Who should be a 99 overall in this football game? I saw something today where people are saying Ollie Gordon's going to be the only 99 huh? overall. No. Ollie Gordon is going to be the only 99 overall in this game. But there's probably only going to be like – I don't I mean, obviously it's been a minute since they made these games. There's probably only going to be like maybe three at the most. So I would say, I don't It's kind of hard to think about, to be honest. Because, I mean, like Quinn Ewers probably has a shot at maybe being a 99 overall. Like you think the top quarterback probably got to have a shot, right? And they're going to view him as probably the top quarterback. Who's the tackle from Ohio State that can't fold? Tackle from Ohio State? No, no. I'm Penn State or whatever. Oh, oh, Shanu? Yeah, I he's think he's gone to the Yeah, NFL. he's in the NFL. There's some, I, I don't know then. The but. the 99 overall tackle is going to be Will Campbell at LSU. Mm. That's a good one. That'll be the one. Cuz I mean, uh, other than that, like there's not a skill player this year that I feel like has been like so established that it's like there's no way they're not a 99. I was, like Caleb Williams last year would have been I was been, looking at the chat. Was Travis Hunter's name brought up? If he was a 97 or 98. Yeah, Travis I, I don't think yeah. I don't think Travis Hunter should be a 99. What about Will Johnson from Michigan? Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. That's, that's a, a good, good one. one. Caleb Downs. Yeah, I mean, I think he's up yeah. for it, but the Malachi fact that he's Starks. only gone one year. Yeah, I mean, Malachi Starks. Starks is a good another option for sure. He's had two the, years now. The tight list is the quarterback room. I don't think there's. I know you already talked about. It. There's not a single ninety nine. No, no, there's not. Not right now. No. Um, even if you look at like twenty twenty five NFL mock drafts, like I saw Connor Weigman. I love Connor Weigman. Connor Weigman's played f like five college football games. Let's hold off on putting him ahead of guys like Quinn Ewers and, and Carson Beck in mock drafts. Let's chill out. Good, uh, but good. it's just not uh, – it's not the class that we have seen yeah. in years past. Good shout from the chat. Luther Burden maybe? Very good shout. Yeah. Yeah, particularly if he's listed as a as a, like a slot receiver. I know they only do receivers. But you think maybe that's something they change? Because, like, I, I'm not, I haven't looked at the depth charts on, like, Madden, for example. But, like, Stephon Diggs is a slot on, on some, you know, formations. And then he plays X on some formations. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I wonder if – they're going to, like, basically, hey, he's a, he's their best player. Here's how they play these guys. Uh, I, that's that's my one concern, one of my concerns. Are you going to actually make it kind of play like they play? Yeah. If other words, in other mm, words. I get that. Um, yeah, I think I think we kind of rattled through all the 99s really, really quickly. It's, not, it's a tight list. Yeah. yeah there's not like, I mean, like, options. even, like, la like, this time last mm. year, if the game was coming out, like, Marvin Harrison, Brock Bowers, right off the bat, easily ninety nines. You could even say Caleb Williams is a ninety nine, but yeah. like, we, there's really not that this year. Tell, Tell you how hard it is. No Travion Henderson. Mm. Honest to God, it's a category. Injuries might get him. He got yeah. he's been banged up for yeah. both two years, so injuries might keep him from being a ninety nine. It's just hard to be a 99 as a Very. running back. You have to be like a game stopper, and there's, you just haven't had that. Yeah, we don't really have those anymore. Oh, is the is the linebacker from Penn State still in college? 
look up the hour lads for Penn State and see if number 11 is still in college because my man's a freak. My man's like 6'3", 240. I don't think, he, like I don't think he is because he's, if he's I remember league. reading some of the mock drafts, I remember seeing a Penn State okay. linebacker. Um, but either way. Yeah, I don't see him. All right. Uh, Abdul Carter is his name. Yeah, no. All right. So, uh, here, oh, wait, yeah, he is. He's right here. It yeah. says he's a junior. Okay, but rising junior. Yeah, I don't know if our lads is updated. I okay. assume it has, but chat is bamboozled by my Sherpa top. By the way, oh, yeah, yeah they're they were, giving you they some. Were giving you some they were giving shit. you and Dan flack for your um, hoodies. And, yeah, they didn't. They weren't rocking with the duck hoodie. I guess I liked it. Looked comfy. Yeah, it did. I didn't get to see him very much, but uh. you know, I can't believe people are hating on the Sherpa. The Sherpa bangs, dog. <laughs> What are y'all talking about? <laughs> this thing is fire. Um, what was I going to talk about here? We we're going to go into the next discussion of this right here. Every time one of these uh, college football games comes out, uh, college football games comes out, or any football game in general, you always kind of h- gravitate towards one team that you play best with. Um, for example, uh, the, the absolutely epitome of random football team that I liked playing with was like the 2009 Florida State Seminoles. With uh, Myron Roll, random name. Myron Roll playing safety. He was the, uh, the the scholar athlete, the one that ended up going over to Cambridge or somewhere in England and, and being a student. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah this yeah. guy. Um, I liked them because they had the sickest uniform option. It was like all black with like the the standard gold helmet. I thought it was sick with the garnet socks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that you was could put black and white cleats on them. It, oh, it was cold. That was um, when the uh, the Nike Pro became yep, big. Yep, 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 yep. Nike Pro Combat one. Um, I loved that, and then I would take Christian Ponder's sorry ass out, put him down, Damn. and then put the backup quarterback in who had a speed of, like, 94. Mm-hmm. And uh, can't remember his name, but, yeah, we we, we was doing folks up in, in, in that one. So yeah. that, that was one of my random-ass teams that I loved. Do y'all have any of these? I've got oh, a bunch. Yeah, I've yeah got, you got a bunch? I've got one that I can really remember, and it was um, Oklahoma State 2013 with Justin Blackman at wide receiver. Mm. Oh, that was OP. You were OK State guy? Oh, dude, it was so much fun. I mean, Todd Munkin, offense coordinator. You were out here showing people you're weeding. Oh, dude. It, <laughs> it was it, – it was, that was always my go-to in 2013 because you could pretty much put Justin Blackman on a streak or any type of route, and he was going to cook every yeah. single time. NCAA 12, Oregon Ducks, with the yeah. Michael James, Kenyon Barter, and DeAnthony Thomas. It didn't matter who the quarterback was. Just run four verts and throw it to whoever runs by the safety. See, you went that way with, with that Oregon team. Yeah, I mean, um, it's just speed. Just so here, here's – if some people are still out here modding NCAA 14, so if, if you want a cheat code, here it is. Get into duos, run halfback counter with mm-hmm. DeAnthony Thomas – but before you do so, take the number two receiver on your left or on your right, whichever side you're running it to, run him in motion. So get into three by one. Yeah. And hopefully you drag the defender with you. Now it's DeAnthony Thomas versus the safety one on one. It's it's touchdown every single time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there were there were OP, like overpowered teams like that as well. NCAA 14 Oregon team was one of these. Mm-hmm. The the Tim Tebow before he was on the cover. Football team was nuts. And here's how I know this. I grew up with a buddy named Eric Lloyd who was a diehard Florida Gators fan. Um, don't think he's still holding strong allegiances nowadays, as you can imagine. A little fair weather. Um, but anyways, uh, used to box my ass with the Florida Gators. And they had one play, six eight nine hook. Okay? six eight nine hook every single time he ran. Is that the touchdown. one where the running back runs and runs a hitch out of the – No, the running back kind of runs a, a, a flare straight to the defensive end and then out. And then the number two receiver kind of runs uh, an in, an up, and then a post. It oh, kinda, it kinda I hate – It kind of looks like yeah. one of those. Yeah, I know what um, you're talking about. And that dude, wide ass open every single time. You know what's a – Never, re- never worked. You know what was a really under-A team? Hmm. NCAA 14 Auburn Tigers. Hey, because yeah. Nick Marshall, Nick Marshall was good, but the album. playbook in that game is unreal because it's yeah. Gus, it's a Gus Malzahn offense. And first year they really were experimenting with read options. And yeah, like all the good so, stuff. so deadly. Yeah, I'm with if you, you know if you knew how to run that offense, you could put some hurt. In those another guys. another example of this: if you know how to run the offense, I had a buddy uh, Ryan Brown used to beat my ass with Georgia Tech just because he thought it was funny. Like yeah. this was bad Dude, Georgia yeah. Tech in the last couple of rounds mm-hmm. of NCAA. But they're out here running the wing, and you could not stop it. Or yeah. I couldn't at least. NCAA, unless you just hopped in bare front. The one I used to do was NCAA 10 with uh, Josh Nesbitt and Demarius Thomas. Ooh. Like, that was a filthy team. Ooh. Josh Nesbitt was a very good video game player. I don't hate it. Me and my buddies used to do where you couldn't pick, like, a big school. You had to pick a group of five. And I, for some reason, I couldn't tell you a single name on the roster at the time. But I always went with Tulsa just because I thought it was cool. I thought, like, the Golden Hurricanes and stuff. I thought that was cool. So, I always went with Tulsa. 
What's the what's the first NCAA you remember playing? The one with Tebow on the cover. Um, I remember playing with Shockley. So, so six. Yeah, it's been a while. I uh, see y'all. Y'all were no. I I remember. I remember subbing out David Green for Shockley. So it was before 06. So you played 05. Okay. Yeah. 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 So y- y'all played like the new games. Yeah. Back back in the day, the Kirby household didn't believe in buying the new the video day. games. So it was like, we're going to go to GameStop. We're going to get the used 99 cents one. Uh. So I put like five years worth on NCAA 04. Uh. And the NCAA 04 LSU Tigers, I don't remember his name. I don't know who it was, but number 14 was unstoppable. Matt Flynn. No, he was a wide receiver. Oh. I don't know. Oh, God, no. I have no I'm idea. I'm going to have to look no that up. I'm going to have to look that yeah, up. Yeah, you're going to have to search some heavy rosters on that one. Man, I am getting absolutely you are, dude. cooked, bro. Man, absolutely cooked. I, you know, I think I look good. So whatever. Chat. He's probably never gonna wear this again. Though. No, I'm wearing it next week. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> I'm wearing it next week. This thing is so warm too. I was about to say that's another thing. Oh it just looks God. cozy. Oh, it is, man. It's like wearing a, uh, it's like wearing one of them uh, throw blankets your wife puts is, on the the couch mm, all the time. It was Michael Clayton. Oh yeah, Michael yeah. Clayton. Had a, uh, Dwayne Bowe was also on that team. Oh, oh Dwayne yeah. Bowe. So yeah, Dwayne Bo. Michael Clayton, NCAA Dwayne Bo, one of the nastiest juke moves in the history of the NFL. That's yeah. the one where he caught the little speed out and then dipped underneath the oh, outside linebacker yeah. and then dead leg the safety mm. and sent the kid into the sideline. <laughs> yeah, Dwayne Bo got some of the nasty, nasty shit on the highlights. Um, I think we covered all those teams. Who's going to be that team in this game? Because I got two answers. I honestly, we were having a conversation um, while you were doing something else, and I think Alabama could be a fun team just because of Jalen Milrow. Like, yeah. if you can get a dual threat, really My solid. Right there. If you can get a really solid dual threat quarterback, then that's Jalen Milrow. Even if he's not the starter, you can sub him in. I yeah. mean, that's going to be a fun team to use just solely off of that. Being and the fact to... that it's in a Kalen DeBoer offense. Like, yeah. it's very creative. And just the fact that I think by nature, uh, something about video game players, uh, if you're bad, it makes it a whole hell of a lot easier if the quarterback can run. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you don't turn the ball over near as much. Yeah. Not as much, <laughs> you know. So. But I mean, another one's gonna be Col- people are gonna play with Colorado. Yeah, yes. Like, people are gonna I, play with Colorado and do y'all everything with Travis. Too. Mm. Ohio State and Ole Miss. Mm. I think Ole Ohio Miss State, is gonna be fun to play. with. I think with. Ohio State's gonna be fun to play with if Will Howard's like an eighty-five speed wise. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jackson Dart, I think they're going to make him that. They're going to make him an athlete at least, someone who can run. You know what team He's could got be six hundred yards rushing? You know what team could be sneaky good? Who? Florida State. Sneaky good in this game? Yes. How, why? Because DJU, a big uh, quarterback with a big arm, a yeah. clunker. Yeah, look, big clunker, look, though. look. Here's the thing. Accuracy and decision making matters so much less in a video game. I disagree. Have you played recently? <laughs> yeah, the Madden. Madden I be penalizing bro, you for I don't play accuracy, Madden. bro. I haven't okay, played Madden so in years. I I know I don't care how much they say it. I, they haven't made a damn video game in ten years. I guarantee you that gameplay feels something like Madden. Yeah. And I'm gonna tell you this right now: if you don't know how to read coverages. If you don't know how to not throw into tight windows, you're going to throw seven interceptions every game you play. I promise you. It's no longer uh, we can just spam slants. You know what I mean? Like, you can't you can't do it like that anymore. Um, so, yeah, it actually – and that, that – not to transition the conversation, but a lot of people have big fears and they have big worries and big excitements about this football game. My biggest fear about this game coming out is that it doesn't play like real-life football. That if if mm. I go out there and I throw a ball with anticipation, like, hey, I know that guy's throwing a dig or he's running a dig. If I throw it as he begins to break down, don't spaz out. Like he's gonna eventually keep running. Like I'm just throwing it with proper timing. And you know, I don't. There's a variety of different examples like this, but I felt like in old football, old college football games, there were certain things that you could do. Like I was just saying that you could just trick the game. And it's like, oh, this is a, a, a cheat code. I'm just going to run this, and this is going to be my base offense. I hate that. That You yeah. can't do that in real life football. Mm-hmm. No, you can't. Mine is – it's because every video game has started to gear towards this, and it's microtransactions, but specifically for this. Ugh. This is what I don't want. I don't want to be in my dynasty mode, and when the offseason comes and it, they, I get this notification of – the five-star quarterback that you just recruited is going to hit the portal unless you can pay him eighty thousand dollars, and I have to pay fifty bucks to get eighty thousand points or whatever Ooh. put into my account so I can keep my five-star that's quarterback. That's so going to happen. That's, that's so, I know it's so diabolical. And I'm I, and if it actually does happen, that's the part I'm going to hate and fear the most. I'll be playing online. You, you I, miss me. Yeah, I'll be doing the online and road glory, I guess. And that's my that's the thing I'm looking forward to most 
I'm looking forward to this game coming out so I can stop having to play Call of Duty with my friends because Call of Duty has become the biggest scam in the history of scams. I just paid $80 for the brand new Call of Duty game. Yeah. And the third update, the third update on the damn game was basically them just reverting to the last Call of Duty I paid $80 for. Yeah. It's the same online maps. It's the same Warzone maps. It's the same bullshit. Same guns. Same guns. And I'm out here, what? Y'all got, yeah, I'm a fool. So yeah, if they're out here with the, with the scamming, I ain't going to be with it. You're going to yeah. see me on online playing yeah. head-to-head, -head, and that's it. If you want to do it in Ultimate Team, I get that because you want to buy packs and stuff. But don't do that stuff for, like, Dynasty mode and whatnot. Like, keep it yeah, separate at least. Keep that shit out of here. My biggest worry of this game is that it's buggy. Like, Yeah, it just doesn't load. Like, correctly. I mean, like, the fact, like, I can under, I can tolerate, oh, you know, this game's too arcadey. It doesn't play, like, real football. I can tolerate not being able to play Dynasty mode because I have to do extra payments and stuff. If you cannot play the actual game itself yeah. because – whatever glitches are happening that scares me the most if the game's not played i can tolerate all the other shit that fear could very well become realized i don't know if you i don't know how much y'all time y'all spent on social media today but one of the biggest and most retweeted things i saw was a computer developer basically saying that if you noticed in that reveal the only real action of gameplay that they give you is like literal blueprints mm -hmm. like they have the figure and then everything else is like data mapped. They haven't figured it out yet. And like I don't know if that was – was that just to, to tease? So, or are they literally at that stage I, or where are they – you so know what I'm I saying? Think, yeah, I think they're further than that stage because that – Why would you tease something more of a complete product? All we got today was freaking Brutus and a, a Georgia helmet – and a dude standing in front of or inside of USC Stadium, like and a vague picture of New Stadium. Stadium. Mm -hmm. We did not get very much of a product. No, and I, I think they did that intentionally because I mean, if you look at the previous timelines, they usually don't come out with stuff until like late March, early That's April uh, for announcements. And so I think this was more just like, hey, we are doing this. And they shot that commercial back like during the Rose Bowl because mm. they were like there were photos going around of like, hey. EA Sports is here during the Rose Bowl, like shooting something. So the commercial itself is probably a month and a half old because then you got to go into editing and all that. So I don't think that that's where the game is right now in development. Mm. At least that's I hope fair. not. Hope, hopefully not. I mean, it took them 11 years, yeah. <laughs> but most of it was because of name, image, and likeness. And everybody kind of feel. I don't remember any type of legislation coming down on the on EA Sports. But at some point, it just kind of felt slimy. Is that is that where we got? What? what Why did like? they stop making the game? Because the whatever basketball player it was sued the EA Sports for using their name, image, and likeness for the basketball game. Because they used to have yeah. a college Blake basketball Griffin? game. Yeah. No, it wasn't Blake Griffin. It was someone small within the game that was like, hey, this person is clearly me. I'm suing you. I EA, stop person, doing. I hope that person wakes up every single morning and stubs his toe. Just yeah. doink right on the corner yeah. of the bed. And it only but then, takes one. But then EA eventually was like, this is going to become too much of a headache. We're not going to do it. We're just going to invest all of our capital into Madden. All right, so. well, I'll be streaming it. I got some word today that apparently there's going to be some YouTube allowances. or allo oh, Allowances? Yeah, they're yeah. going to allow some things over here with regards to streaming. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, rate, review, and let's go on to our next topic, which is the most impactful coaching move. Um, and the one rule, Saban was not allowed to be brought up here. Fair so enough. So Saban leaving obviously was the most impactful coaching move decision uh, happening of the offseason. So let's avoid that one. I'll give you my first option. Um, I think – not first option, one of my first ones. I think Jonathan Smith is a damn good football coach. And some people listen to this like, who is Jonathan Smith? Jonathan Smith turned Oregon State into a winner. And before Jonathan Smith – Oregon State was 1-11, and they had won seven games in the previous three seasons combined. By the time he left, they were per almost – well, they spent six weeks in, around, near the top ten. All right, this season. Be a good so, program. Like a really good football program, and he did so at Oregon State. Now, granted, had a lot of continuity with that program, had a lot of familiarity with that program. He is an alumnus of that program. Um, but I thought Oregon State's football team – it wasn't like they magically started recruiting at a top 15 program level. They started coaching and executing like a top 15 program. And if if we were to make a, hey, who's the equate version of Kalen DeBoer? Based off of, uh, of status and record, it's Jonathan Smith, and he's mm -hmm. going to a really good or a decent middle of the pack, top end of the pack, Big Ten program in Michigan State. Mm -hmm. 
I think the easy thing to do with this one was to crap on it when it happened. But I think Bill O'Brien has an impact on Boston College. I think it yeah. draws some interest. I think people are going to tune in to Boston certainly College. From the, certainly from the coaching world. I mean, yeah, world it, it's, it's at least a somewhat of a headline name. And I think people are definitely now going to be paying attention to Boston College football solely for the reason of we're either playing on this man's downfall to say we told you so or it's going to become one of the biggest storylines in college football. And just to carry on, I mean, one of my most impactful coaches here is the Chip Kelly hire, right? Which – and we joked about it before the show, if Bill O'Brien doesn't get hired at Boston College, then Chip Kelly probably doesn't end up at Ohio State, which is a wild statement to me. Um, it almost – I'm about to I'm about to give uh, kudos to Ryan Day for being able to hire Chip Kelly while also wondering, if Chip Kelly was available, why in the hell would you ever hire Bill O'Brien? Why would you ever go through that one? Um, not Again, I think Bill O'Brien is great. But Bill O'Brien has no background, no history, no prior having stance, okay, at all with Ryan Day or, or Ohio State football or any minglings there. Um, yeah, he spent some time at, up at New England and he spent some time with Penn State. But, like, that, I, I think, no, that was a different coach. Is that Bill O'Brien? That's Bill O'Brien. Penn State, yeah. Penn State. So, anyways. He took over after yeah, the – that's what I thought. CTE brain. You got to let me go. Um, anyways. I, I, why, why would Bill O'Brien be an option if Chip Kelly ever was? But Chip being hired there, um, listen to this, guys. UCLA, over the last four seasons, has averaged 221 yards per game on the ground. Whoa. Oh, yeah. Ohio State hasn't rushed for more than 200 yards per game in the last three seasons. Ohio State averaged like 150 yards per game this year on the ground. They immediately become like in, like incredibly better on the ground and you the added moment one, Chip Kelly steps in. Yeah, and you added one of the best running backs in college football as you well. You added one of the best running backs, and you added a quarterback in Will Howard who's 6'5", 235 pounds, and has, I think last year, had four games of more than 12 rushing attempts. Hmm. Now, granted, in college there's some sacks added into that, but this is a dude who definitely can utilize his legs. And it, it totally made me rethink the Will Howard addition. You know, when we first heard about this, I was like, ooh, not a great thrower of the football. And the data, in, in terms of he needs to throw it a bunch to win us a football game today. And the data proves this true, and the film does as well. Uh, Will Howard was one in four last year in games in which he had to throw it more than 30 times, okay? Um, in those five football games, again, one in four, he turned it over seven times, all right? This was not a guy that you could say, hey, Will, need 38 attempts today. We got to win. Uh, it, it probably wasn't going to end well for you, at least at K-State. I don't uh, assume that is going to be 100% translatable over to Ohio State. If you throw it 35 times with Ohio State's guys, you're going to win more, game, more, more games than you would if you threw it 35 times with K-State's guys. That's mm -hmm. simple math and, and simple – uh, talent measuring sticks, if you will. But nonetheless, this addition of Chip Kelly drastically increased my thoughts of Will Howard, the quarterback hmm. at Ohio State. Hmm. Yeah, that's definitely – like I feel like that is definitely one of the big butterfly effects in college football. I think one that's kind of going under the radar happened today. Sean, oh, yeah. Sean Elliott's joining South Carolina staff. Not, I, I think the, the dust on the head coaching movements has settled for the most mm. part. But Sean Elliott leaving leaves a spot open at a Power 5 Division 1 school. Not Power 5, but a Division 1 school. Yeah. That's going to be filled by a staff member that's probably very valuable to some major team. And something we're definitely going to have to talk about in the local hour because there is some mutual interest, it sounds like, based off the intel that I'm getting. What do you got? I think early on we can classify Fran Brown as an impactful hire mm. at Syracuse. I mean, that dude immediately got to work for the Orange and was putting them on the map, quote-unquote, in recruiting, being involved, getting a social media presence going. I mean, you heard more about Syracuse football than you have in quite a while. Dude's out there throwing the football with fraternities, like getting yeah. involved with the community. That dude is making an impact. Chad and Brad definitely asked for a selfie. <laughs> I'm shocked we didn't see one. That yeah. Is, but, yeah, I think that he's going to have an impact on Syracuse football, making them at least more relevant than they have been in the last 10 years. Do you think he had to introduce himself? Or do you think they knew who he was? I don't think he even introduced himself. I think he just walked and was like, let me get a couple tosses. And they were like, okay. Like, hell, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, brother. Hell yeah, let's get it. Um, how about Jeff Levy at Mississippi State? Now, this isn't impactful from a dude might win a national title sometime soon at Mississippi State. I don't believe that to quite be true. Um, however, it's going to impact how I watch football on Saturdays. Um, I'm going to seek out some Mississippi State football games like I haven't before, or at least I haven't since probably the first year of Mike Leach. Um, I'm going to be turning on the TV to see what they're doing. And here's the other thing. I think it's going to work. 
I think it's going to work at Mississippi State, at least to whatever extent working looks like at Mississippi State, because I think there's one rule. If you're the Mississippi State head football coach, you better be pounding Mississippi JUCOs. You better be pounding Mississippi high school players. Like, they should not leave your state. Believe it or not, in terms of offensive line, defensive line production, and skill players, I would say per capita, the state of Mississippi puts it out as high and as well as anybody else in the country at those two spots. Big fellas and speed. Big fellas and speed. Mississippi does it as well as just about anybody, again, per capita. And guess what? You look at the class, guys. He signed 14 kids this class from either Mississippi JUCOs or Mississippi high school football programs. I'm going to tell you what. He's going to have speed and he's going to have size, and he's going to have good offense to go with it. And the other thing, he's going to sneak a freak in here every once in a while. Did you notice, and a lot of people probably didn't because they're not studying up on Mississippi State football, Mississippi State football added two, not one, two six foot six, 235-pound tight ends this offseason. One of them from Buffalo, the other one from Vandy. And both of them are big, massive, look like dudes. So Jeff Levy, to me, going to be really, really fun to watch. Don't know if they're going to win, you know, double-digit football games, but they're going to be fun. Yeah, I saw some people calling it like an underwhelming hire, like they don't think that it was a great hire or whatever, which Gave I feel like six if, million. If, if that's your standard of Mississippi State because they didn't hire the big name or they didn't hire a well-known name in college football or whatever, like whatever you want to deem it or a hot candidate, then that, you're never going to be pleased with who Mississippi State hires because it's never going to be the process for them. That's never going to be the coaching hire standard for them. I think that Jeff Levy can easily go in there and please the crowd and have somewhat of a fun football team to at least watch. Like, they're going to be the most fun 7-5 and five football team in the country probably. Yeah, teams like that, it's more about the culture and the aura around you. Make it. I mean, that's what Mike Leach was. Like, Mike Leach itself was like, hey – What's Mike Leach got to say, or how's how's Mike Leach's team doing? So I think Jeff Levy's going to bring an element of that, not obviously not in a Mike Leach kind of way, because no one can re- recreate what he's done or what he was. But I do think Mississippi State becomes a much more interesting team, just the way they play. No doubt. Do you have any other hires? No, th- I had my two candidates. I mean, I think the LSU hires. All of them. He hired a whole entire team. Yeah, I, like, I think that's going to make Just a huge – LSU defense? Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, the team's going to look – I mean, the fact also you lost Jaden Nance, but LSU's going to look completely different from the way they did last year. I think you could also say Mike Elko for the fact of he's going to impact – the entire tra- – not trajectory, but it's going to impact the, like, the direction of that program because where it was headed with Jimbo Fisher was not a good direction. And just the overall like environment that program was currently in with Jimbo Fisher and how the group of players that they were bringing in, just kind of like the mindset over there. I think bringing a guy like Mike, Mike Elko who is still like chasing after his own goals and still chasing after that stardom as a head coach in college football, I think that's going to help redirect that program and get them back to maybe a, a hotter commodity. So, um, Nick Sheridan got promoted as the offensive coordinator at Alabama, and I'm I'm assuming this is a guy that's been with him for a long time. I'm trying to look here. I think so. Um, he was a tight ends coach, and then they promoted him to OC. Now, my question about this is, is he going to call plays? That's what I was going to ask. Because if he ain't calling plays, he's just there in principle. I think he's called plays before, but I don't know how long. Okay. And I don't that's, know where – I'm sure that's something that'll be asked very shortly. I mean, next media availability, probably that's going to be. Because if not, the most impactful move was Ryan Grubb going back to Seattle. Yeah. Or staying in Seattle, I should say. Um, But, yeah. All right. It was leaked yesterday. Yesterday? That um, the SEC is more than likely moving to nine division games, or nine conference games, excuse me, um, most likely by the year of 2026. Now, how did we come about this information? This has been rumored. Uh, this has been m- m- um, hy- hypothesized. Hypothesized. I was going to go myth- like mythology. Mythical? Yeah, myth- mythicalized. Mythicalized. <laughs> there you go. Is that a word? It doesn't think sound so. like one, Shots but we'll roll football. with it. Um, but anyways, this this theory of nine teams has been uh, rumored. And, and uh, yeah, it's been out there in the ether for a little while. Uh, we got confirmation that it's probably coming to the SEC via – uh, Texas' athletic director just running his mouth at a booster club meeting is what it sounded like. Hmm. Um, they were at, I think the term was um, like a, some type of football rally. Um, Whoa. A pep a rally? rally or something. Some type of event where the big wigs stand up in front and basically tell the, the, the status of the football program. Um, it's like a, a state of the address, if you will, for Texas football. 
And the athletic director was asked, I guess, about conference games, and he alluded to we're going to play an eight-game schedule the next two years and then most likely open it up to a nine-game schedule by 2026. But he did caveat there and basically said there's a lot of work to be done before then. And every time I hear a lot of work to be done, my immediate panic brain says Super League. Like, oh, that's what y'all are working on. What else could y'all be working on Mm -hmm. when it comes to scheduling? Um, Scheduling is pretty straightforward, so much so that they schedule it out 10 years in advance. So this idea that you got a lot to work on to get your schedule set ain't nothing to do with the schedule. It's about who you're trying to play, I would imagine. But um, what does this mean for the SEC? Basically, I did some reading today. Um, You're going to have three permanent opponents and then six rotating, um, which immediately – I can't wait. I can't wait until they're announced so I can hear every single solitary football program bitch moan and complain about how their three permanent teams are way harder than everybody else because life ain't fair. Mm -hmm. We're going to get somebody that's like, for real, look at ours. We got a gauntlet. You know what I mean? But it's the SEC. Like, you're going to get tough teams in there. Yeah, everybody's going to have at least one tough team that you're always going to have to play every single year. And the team that gets two, I'm telling you, their fan base is going to be on Twitter talking about this some more shit. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's probably just going to be your your three biggest rivals. Like, Alabama would get Tennessee and Auburn for sure, and then one other. I'm just (laughs) going to wear a white T-shirt. That's what I'm going to He He looks like a bouncer. You got Josh paid it? This is my favorite. He looks like a bouncer at an Indian casino. Wow, that's not bad. I'm glad I'm jocked enough to do that. That's pretty cool. Um, read through those, Kirby, and see if you can find me some good ones we need to rattle off. Because I, I, you know what I want to encourage? I want to encourage the chat to be creative. Okay, even if it's at the, uh, you know, the peril of me, even if it's at the the expense of making fun of me, I do yeah. encourage a good, active, hilarious chat. So Kent, shouts out to you guys. Kenneth Crosby says, "My man about to hit the slopes." <laughs> Hell yeah. MK Canty says, Brooks looked like Patagonia threw up on him. <laughs> Never shopped at Patagonia. <laughs> no Navajo or waterfall <laughs> were harmed in bringing you in this fleece. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. Um, yeah, some good stuff right there. Always got some good stuff in there. Somebody told me last, a couple of episodes ago, that we have no sponsors, even though we have a really big sponsor. We have no sponsors because I don't wear pants often enough. Um, well, you now, don't you don't wear like formal dress pants. You have shorts on most of the time. I do. You're I not do. you're not tidy white. You don't need the desk over there. Um, but yeah, apparently <laughs> my wardrobe is a is a hot topic. So I, maybe this is why. Maybe this is why our boy Josh dusts off a of fresh Hanes every time he goes on to the show. Um, and yeah, I ain't going there. But you know, used to if you notice when we had the old backdrop, I used to wear exclusive black. Like, mm-hmm. I was in black everything. Black designer, like, uh, graphic tees, black T-shirts, black, black, black. That's to hide my fat. Um, and now, I painted everything in the damn room black. And now I can't wear black because I was like a floating head. So, you get Sherpa fleeces and you flame those. <laughs> Brooks looks like a cave on a wall in Arizona 600 years ago. That's a good one. Mm, that's a, that is that's a good one. That's not bad at all. That's not bad at all. Where'd you get that? Brooks looks like he's in the witness protection program on a Navajo reservation. <laughs> where'd you Where'd you get that? Uh, I don't want to give it out because I've I've actually had people try to like bite my style on this one. I've I've had multiple people ask me for it. So this way, like we got half the chat hat, hating and half the you chat gatekeeping. Going, Hell yeah, yeah I'm always gatekeeping, gatekeeping dog. My my steez is my steez. I ain't gonna sit out here getting flamed for it just so you can go wear it and get compliments. I'm not gonna wear it. I'm not not gonna wear it. Yeah, you won't catch me in that one. Not my. I'm not saying that it looks bad on you. I was actually like, dang, that's actually kind of nice. But sound like a comment from someone who know where his paychecks are signed. Um, hey, we got a whole other hour coming up right now. Welcome to Talk the Dog, the show where we find a bone to pick and a take to give. These are not hot takes. These is dog takes. Can I talk that dog? Let's shut up and grab some tape. Now you're right. Nice.
910 Cooper says, Brooks looks like he shoots the decoy ducks on accident. <laughs> it's not bad, bro. It's not bad Brock at all. Brock Vandegrift is somewhere laughing his ass off at that one. Oh, yeah. Brock uh, Vandegrift's eating that up. Brock Vandegrift <laughs> would be eating this whole entire attire up. He'd be like, huh, look at that sissy. Can't even grow facial hair. Look at him wearing that fake denim. Look at him. Um, good stuff from there, uh, from the chat. Uh, welcome into the local hour. I got an opening for you, and it's nothing to do with football. Man, we, we never we never stop being suckers. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Um, I've been married, uh, ooh, I've been married since 2019, so four years coming up on five this uh, fall. Um, I've been with my wife for nine years. With this, we just finished up our eighth Valentine's Day together, and Aww. it's very very important. I've always said when it comes to these things with re- with regards to relationships and gift giving and just relationship management in general. If you set and manage expectations, life goes a whole hell of a lot easier. So a conversation, for example, that I had with my wife yesterday, very early on in the morning was, hey, I totally forgot. No, I didn't forget the date. I know the date was here. I totally forgot what the standard is for this date. Do you get a card? Like in our family, we have to write cards from the kids. And like, so I have to sit down with my kid and write his name with his own hand and then Mm -hmm. give it to my wife because it was something that her parents did for one another. And and it's just her expectations, what she wants to have during these days so you should be doing this you should be finding out not what your wife wants but what your wife needs on these types of days what are the basic requirements and i'm lucky enough that my basic requirements for my wife are just some general spending some time with me i want good food and i want to spend good time with my husband so we played a little golf yesterday we ate a little steak and lobster here at the house we had a good little time here at the house but here's what i'm talking about we never stop being suckers none of us none of us men ever stop being suckers Because while I'm going to the grocery store to pick up dinner for us to cook, bro, it looks like, you you know, when COVID first hit and everybody was pillaging the village for all the toilet paper? Oh, yeah. That's what it looked like in the chocolate aisle. In the chocolate aisle and the the rosary aisle or the roses aisle, it was nothing. But I'm talking about suckers from my age up until they mid-60s. We never stop being suckers for this date. So Mm. um, we got to figure something out. We got to band together. We gotta uh, pr- we gotta prove to college football players everywhere that men can unionize for a collective effort and collectively bargain the fact that I ain't gotta be spending thirty dollars on some Publix roses on this day to tell you that I love you. I love you, and you know this. Preach. So this no, it never stops though. You never stop being a sucker. This is the one holiday that I'm like, I'm so glad I'm single, dude. This the one holiday. This is the <laughs> like, if I had to pick one that makes me glad, it's this one, dude. Huh. That's solid. Interesting. Uh, my only tip, marry well. You know what I mean, like. Feel feel the process out on the on the materialistic possessions. That's all I'm gonna say. You know what I mean? Super materialistic is not great. Mm. In my in my personal opinion, and I married extremely extremely well on that end. Welcome in. We got a loaded show for you guys tonight. There was some staff turnover over the week or during the week, I should say, during our absence from you guys since Tuesday. Um, I believe Kirby Smart has his best marketing ploy to date. And he's been making it since he came to Georgia, okay? They have been just absolutely laying down uh, a, a clinic in marketing ploy in this one department. And with, I know it's been a lot of college football video game talk tonight, but for you Georgia fans, I think you're thoroughly going to enjoy this one. We're going to go about picking the ultimate team tonight for the University of Georgia. What does that mean? We're going to basically create a 53-man roster of the best football players from the University of Georgia and put them on and select them onto a roster that we have set parameters on. So it's going to be a great show. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button, like, subscribe, and rate, and review, and let's get on after it. Um, let's be brief. Let's be very brief with this Scott Cochran uh, story. Scott Cochran stepping down as a special teams coordinator. Kirk Benedict will be taking his place. I want to do more talking about Kirk Benedict than I do want to be talking about Scott Cochran. So let's talk about Kirk Benedict. Who is this guy? Kirk is a grown man. Kirk has been coaching football for a long time, I found out today. Um, I've been aware of Kirk Benedict because you see him. When you see big chin, like big broad chins on dudes, um, six two and above, six three and above, I don't know about y'all, but I size them up immediately. I'm, I might be just my eyes drawn to him. You're a big, you're a big man, very big man here in Kirk Benedict. Don't know if it's worth any uh, you know tidbits for you in terms of a football story, but very large human. Um, but been coaching football at a high level for a long time. In 2014 at the University of Duke, or Duke University, I should say, 
he became a, a graduate assistant. His sole role was to help out with special teams uh, quality control, essentially. He basically stayed in that role all the way through his graduate assistant uh, program and then was hired full-time uh, to be an analyst at Duke, then spent time as an analyst, then eventually became the special teams coordinator, then eventually became the director of recruiting for the defensive side of the football. Bottom line, this dude went from being a good football player to a great special teams coach that climbed the ladder and ended up on a, on a coaching staff at the University of Georgia, and now he is your special teams recruiting coordinator. Scott Cochran, for me, in my personal opinion, was far more of an asset from an energy and recruiting standpoint than he ever was changing the game special teams-wise. I'm going to be honest with you. I, we make jokes about special teams. I do at least. And, and it's all fun and games. And, and to, to be honest with you, it's kind of a spoof. I believe in the unit. I still believe you got to win two out of the three phases. That, that's my core identity and trait as a football person. Okay, I want that to be stated. But coaching special teams at Georgia is, uh, I mean, a nutless monkey could do it. I'm going to be honest with you. Here's your job. Take a roster that basically could win the ACC and go cover a punt. Come on, dog. Like, we, we should be able to coach that one up. Um, this, is, this is a job now at Georgia far more about, hey, make sure everybody's out on the field at the right time, pay attention to everything, scout the opponent at the right, you know, depth that we need to, and be an asset on the recruiting trail. It's not trying to win the game in the margin of special teams. That's not Georgia football. There was also an offensive analyst role, right, that opened up? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, Dickey. Darryl. Yeah. <laughs> which they, they could go any which way with that one. Yeah. My, my mom called me about that. She's like, what is an offensive analyst? I was like, <laughs> odd story for you to be calling me about, Mom. First of all, why aren't you sending me a screenshot of our article? Why are you sending me a screenshot of the ops article? I don't appreciate that. Um, boo. But boo. <laughs> boo, Mom, boo. Boo. Um, but anyway, she's like, what is this? And I'm like, I mean, I don't even know what his honest-to-God role is. He probably doesn't he, either. He takes the offense analyzes and he analyzes it. it. Yeah. But sometimes he'd be analyzing future defensive opponents. So what he then? He's, he, he's he still offensive-minded when he's doing it. Oh, okay, okay. He has the offense's best interest. He's Checks analyzing out. for the offense at that point. There you go. But most of the time, these roles are filled from a, a connection. Yeah. Like, you ain't getting that job unless you know somebody. Mm -hmm. Sounds about right. Yeah, so – um, or you played there. I think we're gonna we we saw with Warren Erickson. Is Warren Erickson the first one? Prather Hudson. Prather Hudson and Warren Erickson, the first two football players that have come back to coach for Kirby and played for Kirby. I think so. Um, I feel like there's another one we're missing off the top of my head. Yeah, but it might it might hit me soon. But maybe like a walk on receiver that maybe, ended up being or something like that. But these 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 two guys played roles and came back and yeah. Came back oh coaching. yeah, no. Um, there, I'll tell you later. Say less, say less. All right. Um, I I think I think there is a massive massive marketing ploy that's been going on at the University of Georgia. Okay, let's hear and, it. Huh? Let's hear it. And I I don't know if he's doing it on purpose, but my analytics show it is it is absolutely pouring back. Okay, into the market, which is uh, all this uniform stuff at the University of Georgia. I think somewhere down the line. You know, Kirby did the keep the main thing the main thing. Gave you some white jerseys against UMass or some slappies from the mid-majors or whatever. Gave it to you in a bowl game one time. But most of the time, Georgia fans have been drastically deprived from uniform combinations. And I know you might be listening to this and you'd be like, I don't give a shit. I, they won two national titles. I don't care what uniforms they wear. Um, I would say you might feel that way. But your fellow Georgia fan does not. Because I have been covering this program for almost five years now. And there ain't an article, video, topic, tweet one that I can put out that will get hotter and more attractive or, or, or more uh, attention than anything about uniforms. And I think, guys, that has been created and that has been a pathway that has been created for this need because it's simple uh, supply and demand. There is a ton of demand for Georgia to wear these cute, cool uniforms, and there is no supply of it. So you just talk about it all the time, and you crave it. You want it. You want it. You want it. You want it, and you never really get it. I'll never forget covering the national title and the hottest article that weekend was, look, Georgia reveals game day threads. Everybody knew that they were wearing what jersey color yeah. they were going to wear, and it was just the, the Twitter. They put a chrome check on it. That was the only difference. That was it. They took a close-up picture of it and a couple other pictures of the jerseys, and we did a look article, and it was the hottest Bands. article that we wrote the Bands. whole weekend. A national title. And that jersey's hottest topic. Frustrating. 
extremely frustrating as someone who uh, relies strongly upon the uh, market of journalism. The fact that I, I mean, I could sit down, we could break news, we can break news in a in a realistic journalistic ma- manner and fashion. And I write some damn jerseys about a potential black jersey, or I release an article about a potential black jersey leak, and all hell has broken loose. All hell has broken. But loose. imagine breaking news on black jerseys. Oh my god, we're we're chilling, bro. We're, we're here, rich. baby. We're here. We need a- and you know what? Here's here's the mess up thing. The equipment staff knows this. I'm not ratting no equipment staff out because I know y'all ain't supposed to be talking to nobody. But every time I talk to them, I'm like, y'all mother. Because every every Friday. Oh, they're trolling. Oh, they troll big time. Back in black. Well, they they play some ACDC shit or yeah, whatever. Uh, you, as you, the, video. the one the one before. Um, I don't know what game it was this year where they're like. This is how we do to get ready for a Georgia football game. They're like loading up all the uniforms, and they had the black uniforms hanging on the yep. coat rack in the they back. Know. They know what I'm telling Bro, you right tr- now. They're trolling. Is that man? Y'all want some jersey reveals, man? Y'all would kill to be Oregon Duck fans. Hey, but guess what? That new video game's gonna come out, and you best you can believe play all those, of them. Those black jerseys. You think? I don't. I don't give a shit. They're about gonna none be of in that. there. They're so gonna be in there. I don't give a shit there. about none of that. I want that white helmet. That's what I want. I want that white helmet sitting right here. I think that white helmet from Georgia looks better than any helmet in college football right now, except for maybe the white helmet with the with the uh, uh, pearly blue that Ole Miss wears. Mm. That one's hard. I don't know. But I like. I think Florida State still got them beat. Mm. I like LSU's white. That's yeah, too standard mm. for me. Too standard. Um, UNC. UNC is nice. All the Army helmets are sick. Yeah, Army's. Ooh, dude, Army uniforms are going to go so hard. Thank you for your service. Um, Dude, I'm so so excited for this football game. I can't can't stop thinking about it. Yeah, I'm I'm not so excited because I can already see work productivity going down. You can already see it. For who, us? Yeah, in general. So here's what we're going to have to do. No, dude, I got to purchase my five-star quarterback somehow. Yeah, no, here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to figure out a way to produce content around dicking around this video game because I, I i'm not we that's can't what i'm be, saying it's gonna come out, out at the perfect time, time no, for that look, to happen look. but i, I you do all, think work it is. comes first has there been a better marketing ploy for georgia i don't know how, i don't know how it behooves him um in terms of uh bringing attention to the program and building hype but hype and anticipation <sighs> around any part of your program in a positive light is always good i do, think i think a better marketing ploy that he's instilled has been winning back-to-back national championships mm. But as far as what you don't do on the field, yes. Take. <laughs> yes, that's probably the best one. I can think of one that I think was – the one that I think maybe would rival it was his first recruiting class. And it mm. was like the whole we ain't done yet. Uh, he was – G-Day? It, what, G-Day? 90K, 93K But day? like the whole thing – yeah, 93K Day was a good one. But like the whole recruiting class was like Richard the Count, Jake Fromm, Lee Caring, all those guys. And Sick they were doing specialty videos for each and every one of them mm. to commit. That I mean, that had George, the Georgia fan base running rampant all over Twitter, just like blowing up all over. They absolutely ate it up, and I think it kind of like re sparked this energy of the fan base and following recruiting, really being passionate about it, and just like setting the standard of like this is how it's about to be at the University of Georgia with Kirby Smart. I like it. Um, I know there's some. I love this comment, and this is I, this might be Kirby's burner. I am 45 years old, have been referred to as a boomer on multiple occasions, but. Fact is, jerseys, pants, and helmets ain't never won a damn game or lost one. Uh, Facts. He's right. I don't know. That one time you wore black against Bama, it might have lost you the football game. Oh, no. Game. You see those nah. videos of those dudes laying down in the end zone and yeah, hiding themselves for kickoffs? Game. Say what? He's got a You point. see those videos of dudes laying down in the end zone, blending with the end zone on kickoffs, getting hey. a pump, kick return? That might help you win or lose a game. They don't help. Saying. Look, jerseys don't. earning his chair every take like that. That's a good one. <laughs> Jerseys don't help you win a football game, but they make moments more special. If I say 2008 Auburn, or mm. two, was it 2008? 2007, 2007 Auburn, immediately. Oh, black jerseys. That's when we had the blackout, first mm. blackout. Mm. Sugar Bowl against Hawaii, black jerseys. New Mexico State, wasn't it? I played no. New Mexico State. UNLV, who was it? 2016 was. Who was the West Coast FCS team you came out here and, and wore black jerseys? In 2016? 2016 was yeah. the Louisiana Lafayette Raging Cajuns, I believe. Hell yeah. Isaiah McKenzie had two yeah. touchdowns. Hell yeah. yeah. Solid day to wear black jerseys. Mm-hmm. And then the Cincy game, of course. And the Mississippi um, State. He's only done it three times. All right, there was a coaching change. It is the local hour, and there was a coaching change here locally. Um, Sean Elliott out as the head coach at the George at the University of Georgia. At Georgia State University. Um, spent about six or seven years there, Kirby. 
Maybe seven yeah, years. Yeah, I want to say 2015 was his first year. been a while. Um, and it's been about what it's been over there. And he has left the head coaching job there to become the tight ends coach um, at South Carolina. And a lot of people were quick to blame the world of college football for this one. I saw a lot of that. Sean Elliott even did it. Sean Elliott told people at the at the Senior Bowl that, you know, he just didn't feel comfortable as a head coach anymore. There's just too much going on in the NIL and the recruiting space. Well, Bubba, I'm here to tell you, you're going to have to recruit at, at, at South Carolina as a tight ends coach. Um, and now I guess you get to do it with a little bit more uh, momentum and a little bit more, uh, you know, firepower, if you will, than you would at Georgia State. But you're not running from college football. So this idea that college football was the reason for you running a little bit different. I think the real reason here, and you can probably back this up, Kirby, because I know you have a background with Sean, um, at least having been recruited by him. He never moved down here. His family never left Columbia. His kids go to yeah. high school in Columbia. He, he travels back and forth every weekend to Columbia. This has not been a guy that ever made Atlanta, Georgia his home. Mm -hmm. This is a guy that made Atlanta, Georgia his occupation. Yeah, well, I think it's part of that, and I think it's also you look at the last two seasons they had. They went they went eight and five in twenty twenty one. Things were looking up. They followed it up with two straight losing seasons. And they return. I think their returning production this year is one hundred and twenty ninth in college. Yeah, football. so I mean the writing's on the wall that like this year is probably not going to be better either. Yeah. I think he what he did was kind of let's get ahead of the curve. Let's go to somewhere else where you lose your 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 job security kind of declines and go somewhere else like a power five division one sec school and say hey get to rebuild here coach what is he coaching tight ends i believe yes build a rapport there and then maybe another group of five head coaching job or an assistant coach or a dc or, or an offensive coordinator job opens up i think that's what he did. i think he just kind of understood that things weren't going to go well this year he's probably going to get fired so he just went ahead and jumped out in front of that beforehand i mean too like Georgia State's on the verge of getting surpassed by Kennesaw State as a superior, like, lower-level lower, lower level college and, and near the city of Atlanta, at least. I mean, they're moving on up now as an FBS program, Division One, and everything. They're, I mean, I'm pretty sure they'll end up being in the new um, college football game. Who do you so, I mean, they're moving on up, and Georgia State kind of staying stagnant, so maybe there's a little bit of that as well. And here's the thing about this football program. In my opinion, that school – should be winning with the athletes that Troy steals from Atlanta. Uh -huh. They should be winning with the athletes that Coastal Carolina comes down here and tries to steal. They should be winning their conference with athletes that UAB definitely tries to steal from this metro Atlanta area. And I could even extend it further. Further, I think UCF came into Atlanta this last couple of years and stole players that Georgia uh, State could potentially maybe one day have an opportunity to do so, right? There are so many great, and I don't have to tell this audience this, there's so many great football players here in the state of Georgia that other programs come and take stabs at because they're great players in Metro Atlanta. Hell, Will Muschamp, it's not a great success story, but Will Muschamp signed about seven or eight players a year from the Metro Atlanta area when he was at South Carolina. If you're a great program at Georgia State, you can kind of put a wall around Fulton County if you really wanted to, and if you did that alone, you're going to be a great mid-major football program. But here's the problem. They have yet, since the time they have been, I mean, even back to Bill Curry being their head football coach, they have not had a head football coach that has the, the energy and the vigor to be out on the, the uh, recruiting trail and the head football coach with the connections in this state to be able to, to, to land some of these prospects. I'm here to tell you, Ricky Lee is a name you don't know. You don't know the name Ricky Lee. But Ricky Lee started as a true freshman at UAB and picked a ball off against Georgia this year. He's from Dagum DeKalb County. Georgia State never called, never sniffed, never wavered, never, never even came in. Why? Because they probably thought they weren't going to be able to land the kid. That type of uh, you know thought process around Georgia State has got to change because there's plenty of availability here. Now, here's the problem. There's no money there, all right, at least in terms of being able to pay their football coaches because my first thought and inclination was that's a job for Dale McGee. Dale McGee is 50 years old. Dale McGee has been the best running backs coach for half of a decade now in college football. And if he were ever to get into head coaching, if he ever wanted to make a run at this thing, this would be the time. And, oh, by the way, Austin McGee, his son, just signed a letter of intent to play at Georgia State under Sean Elliott. I would imagine he's still going to stay there. That was my first thought process, Dale McGee. Then, as I start tweeting and talking about Dale McGee, I get a message from somebody that I trust in the Georgia State circles that's like, hey, you're right in the sense that a Georgia coach might have interest here, but it's not Dale McGee, or it may not be Dale McGee, but it is Brian McClendon. Brian McClendon, I, I've been told, has at least brokered interest 
in potentially taking this job. And, and I would ask you guys this question because I looked it up today. Sean Elliott <clears throat> was making about $800,000 a year as the head football coach at Georgia State. If you're Georgia State, do you bump that up to a million, okay? Get, get a little bit more modern, have a little bit more investment in your football program. And if you're a guy like Dale McGee, do you take a what would be a lateral pay move, okay? Or if you're a guy like Brian McClendon, do you take a lateral pay move to become a head coach for the first time in your career? At Georgia State. No, I don't know. For someone like Brian McClendon, he's always kind of had this feeling around him that he wants to be a head coach. I mean, he's been an interim head coach before. He's been at multiple programs. Now he's at Georgia. It kind of feels like a spot where you get to get get your feet back underneath of you and kind of move forward and get to push your career forward. And if it's, if he wants to be a head coach that badly, like if it is just what something that he's super passionate about wanting to do, this might be the next step to take and eventually kind of push your career forward, like I mentioned, and find your way back up the ranks. And maybe eventually you get into that power five or whatever super league head coaching position that you get down the road. For someone like Dell McGee, though, Dell stuck around at Georgia. And there's so many times there's been lingering information of, oh, you better watch out for McGee to get this job. He might go to this program. He I mean, might take this head coaching job. Like three years there, he thought he was going to Auburn. Yeah, and it just never happens. So that strikes me as – He's kind of if he is waiting for a head coaching job, he's waiting for one that he really, really wants to take. Now, him, being, his son being there, obviously that'd be a good fit. But Brian McClendon, I feel like if that is what you want to do, then that's probably a good move for him. I just, in, in my personal opinion, I can't think of a reason why you would want to increase your workload, increase your stress level, increase your pressure from your position for what is a lateral move pay wise. And I understand, like, the, the long-term aspect of it is, hey, things go well here, you move up, and there you, you, you become go. a better coach. But, I mean, could you not go to a coordinator position at a Power 5 school before you do that? Those aren't really readily available at major programs either. I mean, at, at the major programs you're talking about, right. it's like, hey, come be an OC for a couple of years, and then you're a Power 5 football coach. Um, Chip Kelly just took one of those jobs. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. Um, that, that's kind of my point there. And I, I just – like, with Dale, for example – Dale's going to have to take one of these jobs to skip the coordinating route. Like you're, you're not going to go from Georgia's running backs coach to – like I don't think what Sam Pittman did no, is available yeah. for anybody no. anymore. Or Shane Beamer. Or, or what Shane Be – well, even Shane Beamer was a coordinator, a special teams coordinator for a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I don't think the idea of, of just skipping the line from a coordinator pers perspective is going to land you at a Power 5 job. Yeah. Um, which is why I've always thought that this type of job or Troy or somewhere centrally located to the southeast in the state of Georgia and particularly southwest Georgia, um, Dell would do an incredible job at. I think he's a great recruiter, and I know he's a great relationships developer, which is For what sure. you need in this, in this city. So um, it'll be interesting. I think it's going to – I don't know if it's going to, like, fully impact your roster or your coaching staff at the University of Georgia, but I don't think there's any doubt that those – if Georgia State's hiring committee does not call those two individuals, I don't know what to tell you. I don't, except for they're probably going to hire a dud um, if they haven't reached out to those two guys, which I assume they have. Probably, yeah. All right, let's get into this ultimate team. Here's how this works, guys. Um, we're, we're trying to – I know there's 85 scholarships, but to keep us from picking 85 <laughs> names tonight, we're going to go through and basically assemble what looks to be an NFL roster – for the greatest college football pro or greatest college football team we can assemble using only Georgia football players. So here's how this is going to work. On the offensive side of the football, we're drafting or selecting three quarterbacks, three tight ends. We settled on eight wide receivers, four running backs, and eight offensive linemen. Okay, on the defensive side of the football, we're going to be a 4-2-5 nickel base defense. Okay, what does that mean? We're going to have two nose tackles, four defensive tackles. Three defensive ends, three jacks, two mics, two wills, two stars, two corners, four safeties. Okay. Oh, and um, stars. You did forget about stars, but that's okay. You can think about it as we as we do it. It's right a pretty long segment. Um, and then finally, that's about fifty four to fifty five players is what we rounded up. And then finally, we have one category of this ain't an ultimate team if this guy's not on it. I want to have an excuse to have this guy on the roster. So we have one excuse position on the roster. Chat, I also need your uh, help here. There's going to be a couple of these categories where we know for a fact there are two unanimous selections, for example. And then the third, we're kind of up in air. We, we all have three different answers. You're going to be the deciding factor on who that third or fourth or whatever football player ultimately is selected on this roster. So let's start on the offensive side of the football, guys. And let's start at the quarterback position. 
I and Jonathan are of the belief that this is a very simplistic answer. Um, Stafford, the first round draft pick, Murray, the second round draft pick, Stetson uh, Bennett, the third round draft pick. That's our belief here. Kirby, as you can see, he's got a big shaking head of no why. When you are creating a video game roster, a roster you're going to play a video game, processing goes out the window because you are the processor. You yeah. don't need to worry about, oh, how did this quarterback read defenses and things such as that. You're the one reading defense. So all that skill set goes out the window. You need someone who can throw the ball far, and you need someone who had, has a dual threat ability. Mm. The best quarterback that George's ever had was that was DJ Shockley. Mm. The second best is Stetson Ben. So I would have DJ Shockley as my number one pick. For a video game roster, DJ Shockley. I don't hate it, but um, I've played with Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes on Madden with these ungodly arms, and Matt Stafford fits that category. Um, they're pretty hard to beat. Like They're pretty hard to beat. Uh, at the quarterback position. So I'm, I'm with you. And here's why you really sold me on this, because I did this. I, I used to sub out David Green and play oh, yeah. DJ Shockley because DJ Shockley could run mm -hmm. in those video games. Now, here's what we got to talking about before the show. Uh, do they truly scout these things uh, when they do these ultimate teams? Because DJ Shockley, I think, his career high in rushing yards was like 280. Yeah. Like, it wasn't a lot. Like, he's not a runner. He, he was actually more much more of a pocket passer than people remember. Yeah, I would say that Stetson Bennett was more athletic than DJ Shockley was. Probably, yeah, but but like you look back and just based off of what he was in NCAA 06, I wonder what his speed ranking was in NCAA 06. I think it was like an 87. I don't, so good my, for a my brain does weird things. Which oh, is yeah, so 322 yards rushing his one year starting. About 4 yards in attempt. He had four rushing touchdowns. So, so yeah. Shock is definitely worth a shout, but I also would say that if they were to ever do this, I don't think that Shockley would make the list of the quarterbacks that they would put for Georgia. Yeah, I mean, if we're – Murray's got all the records. Stafford's the most talented. Stett's got the statues. Yeah. yeah I and those are the three that everybody would probably want. My, I think Stetson is the next best choice. He's quick. He can. He yeah. made all the right throws. Stetson would be a fun video game quarterback you, if they yeah. rated. Pro, if they properly rated him I, to his play style. Yes. Yeah, he would be really, really fun. Um, where do we want to go next? Running backs, tight ends, or wide receivers? Gotta go running backs. Running backs. All right, let's go to running backs. We gave you allotted four for this, and I personally think the first three are unanimous selections. Those three, and feel free to argue with me are Herschel, Gurley, and Nick Chubb. Yep. You know, I looked it up today, and I told you guys this before the show. Herschel Walker, during his three-year career, averaged 331 carries per season. No other Georgia Bulldog running back has a singular season of over 300 carries. He averaged what no one else ever has ever done, will yeah, ever do. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty nuts. Um, obvious selection there. I think Gurley and Chubb are obvious selections. Do we all agree there? Oh, yeah. I don't have Chubb or Herschel Walker. And oh, here's God. why. Here we Bro. Go. Bro, you're wilding. Come you're on. Wilding today. Come on. Nick Chubb, Herschel Walker are two of the greatest running backs in Georgia football history. There's no doubt about it. But they're physical runners. And in video <sighs> game, you have to avoid contact. Not You're almost never running up the middle on third. On third you almost never run up the middle in a video game. I already know I hate. I already know I hate playing against guys that play like Kirby, because you know what he does. The first time it loads in on a live game, going straight to the depth chart and changing all the rosters. I do. The first thing you have to deal with is speed, the timeout window. Speed yeah. kills, bro. No, I don't do that. But it sounds like you're you're the guy that I used to play with all the time that would go in and sub out every fast guy. It's like, oh, the kick returner's a ninety three. Oh, the, that guy better be a ninety nine. Yeah, you know, like you, you strike me, and, and based off your comments, so that's who you but are. But like, here's fine. the thing. Here's the thing. You're gonna you're not gonna truck people with Herschel Walker like Herschel Walker did back in the day. As great as Herschel Walker yeah. was, that type of play doesn't translate to video games. Like Derrick Henry isn't an unstoppable force in Madden. So what do you do with the fact that Herschel ran like a ten one and a hundred? Look, he's fast, but he's a power back. They okay. make him stacked. They, they make, make him, him stacked. OP. He's a, yeah, they make him a ninety nine. Dude, touch I'm it. sorry. Look, I, I like <laughs> I, you got I, a look. great thought process here, but if you're not, if you do not have Nick Chubb or Herschel Walker on your list, that's invalid. I have, <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> disrespectful I have, as hell. I have Todd Gurley, DeAndre Swift, and Sonny Michelle. With and no my team is boxing your ass. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, all right. The aside from the, he's actually trying to think about playing video games again. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, which I it's a it's a it's a sound thought process. I don't mean you. I don't mean to make you think I'm making fun of your. No, that's fine. I don't care. Because I, I have no, it's played. a good thought process. Dude, everyone's played like this. Everyone has where they just sub in the fast yeah. guy because they're trying to capture the edge. Like, For sure, I, I totally get it. Everyone has played like that before, so I, I definitely understand. Absolutely, particularly going with you on the Shockley conversation. Like, yeah. yeah, we need a mobile guy in there, or at least somebody who on the video game can run. Um, the fourth running backs, in my opinion, the options and the only options. Um, are Thomas Brown, Noshaw Marino, a Sony Michelle, and Garrison Hurst. So of the uh, of those four names, chat, I want you to give me the one that we are going to sub in here for the fourth selection. Again, assuming that the first three are Herschel, Gurley, and Chubb, who's that fourth running back? Are you throwing in uh, Sony Michelle, Thomas Brown, Noshaw Marino, or Garrison Hurst? Um, let's go on to the tight end discussion because I think this one could be very very quick. I think off the bat, we know two. Right, you got three allotted. We know two for a fact. One, two, three. Brock, Brock. Bowers, Darnell Washington. Yep. Okay, those two are automatics. Now, I want to hear y'all's sub or y'all's suggestions for the third. There's not much of a list for him, to be honest. But I went with Orson Charles. Yeah, Orson Charles too. is mine. We all went Orson Charles. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I kind, of, <laughs> I kind of like debate Randy McMichael, but yeah. but Orson Charles like or some Leonard Pope. Ooh, Leonard yeah, Pope is definitely I just worthy. Remember Leonard Pope because he was huge. Leonard Pope was, was huge, but he was, he was. But he had like a six hundred yard season for that it, time. Yeah. It, he was good, really, yeah. really good for yeah. Georgia. So but he's I definitely th worth a shout. I think Orlson Charles would translate best to this day of college football yeah. and in a yeah. video game. So Leonard Pope walk so Darnell Washington could run for real. Yeah, no doubt. Um, it looks like Marino is going to win that one. No um, shot, baby. No, 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 no shocker there. Um, I, from the Titans discussion, I think Orson Charles is the lock there for number three. Yeah. Just because I, I think he, outside of Brock, he's got the highest receiving yards total in the yeah, season. Yeah. Um, right? I think any record you tied to Georgia tight ends, it was Brock Bowers breaks Orson Charles record for such and such. So I. Uh, Ooh, I ben Watson. Oh, that's a great suggestion. That's another oh, good one. Jeez, we all three for I, I forgot Ben Watson. Ah, finally yeah. happened. Yeah, it was going to happen. It, it right? finally it was, happened. What do you mean finally? It's a third position group. <laughs> Still, I mean, we made it. Ben through. Watson is a great one. Ben, ben Watson is, a, is a really good one. Um, I bumped into Orson Charles at a player's lounge event a couple years back, and uh, I noticed – Oh, man, this isn't this isn't a huge human. Like Orson's only like six two and three quarters, maybe mm -hmm. six three. And I knew at the time Brock's not a huge human, so I was kind of having the conversation with Orson, like, "Hey, man, do you think like you you walked so so Brock could run? Like you were kind of a hybrid move tight end before hybrid move tight ends I, even were a thing. I don't know if I didn't do a good enough job of explaining. He didn't enjoy the comp. Um, <laughs> so there's that. Uh, wide receivers, a lot of them. There's a lot, a lot of them. Uh, two guaranteeds, in my opinion, Terrence Edwards and AJ Green. AJ, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I yeah. think what, I think what's the hesitation there? Don't be disrespectful. Well, I, I mean, no, I'm not, I'm not disrespecting. Not I'm just saying I think there's more than two guarantees. I think George okay. Pickens is an absolute guarantee. Mm. I think Heinz Ward is someone like I think those are four guys that have to be on any list. So yeah. we're automatically guaranteeing George Pickens in here. I put him in there. He's look, he's the most talented wide receiver to play for Georgia in the last 15 years. Like, there's no way you 10, can argue that. Eleven, yeah. You're right. Yeah, like decade. But, I mean, it's, it's a lot of this is built built off like historical success, and George just just simply does not have fair. It. Absolutely fair. George never played more than eight games in a single season. Right. No. Look. Look. From a career standpoint, George is not top four. But yeah. from a if he's a video game player, George is top. Four. That's fair. Um. But I I think the guarantees. I think the unanimous from the chat and us in, as like well. Like you got to have them in there. Good, yeah, AJ and Terrence. Yeah, that's I'm, fine. I'm right. I have no fine disagreement with that. With so that. who are the next group of names? And let me know if I missed anybody here. I got Fred Gibson, Malcolm Mitchell, mm -hmm. Heinz Ward, mm -hmm. Lad McConkey, Tavares King, and then maybe some Muhammad Massaqua. Yeah, there. I put Massaqua on my list. So right. I have I have two guys on there, but because they're also going to be my special teams players. Okay. McCall Hartman and Isaiah McKenzie. I don't hate it. I just don't think there's room for Isaiah McKenzie in this mix. I think Isaiah McKenzie in the slot. Could I be put Mecole over Isaiah McKenzie. Okay. If I had to choose one, I would choose McCole. But I think Isaiah McKenzie. I also think. But do we say taking, Lad? You taking Miko Hardman over Tavares King? No. You taking Miko mm. Hardman over Lad McConkey? He was the last name I put on. the I list. would take Miko over Lad McConkey just because of the special teams abilities. Okay. But um, your list, yeah, you, I don't think you missed any like nah. names. Was like, whoa, bro, you didn't have him on there. I think that's a really good list. I Zach I, Moss I, I hitting do. us with the Lindsey Scott. We thought about Lindsey Scott. Look, I'm, look, only know of the one highlight, my man. I know run, they weren't playing on run, national run. TV that much. 
Lindsey Scott is a like a legend at Georgia football. I don't know if his skill set is matches that legendary status. I like my seven, and we can add an eight with Muhammad. I like AJ Terrence, Fred Gibson, Malcolm Mitchell, Heinz Ward, Lab McConkey, Tavares King, Muhammad Masqua. I don't think there's anybody that we drastically missed on. No, or nah. that doesn't belong. Some really good honorable mentions that you could list, but mm-hmm. I think that's a really solid list. And lads, lads, like I know he really only played three years, but lads, like kind of far down the mm-hmm. totality of a career standpoint. He just no didn't doubt. have the numbers that yeah. the rest of the guys did. Um, all right, now I did some interesting things with offensive line room. Very interesting. Um, I gave you an allotment of eight players, and here's how I did this. Um, I think Georgia is notorious for tackle play and center play. If you pinned me down, held a gun to my head, said, who's the best guard to ever play at Georgia? I don't know. I don't I don't really know. I mean, there, there hasn't been a ton of superstars. I think Tate's been great. Um, you know, there's some potential for Dylan and Micah to be something special. But here's what I did, okay? I took the four – best tackles that I know of at the University of Georgia, okay? And combined a little bit of their their pro success, right? So I got Andrew Thomas and Matt Stinchcomb as my first, like, yeah. set of tackles. And then behind them, I'm going to rotate Broderick Jones and George Foster. Mm. Okay, shouts out to Foster. That is a good. Um, so I'm going to select those guys at tackles. Now, because of the lack of, like, superstars and the lack of difference makers at the guard position, please don't kill me and eat me, Ben Cleveland. Here's what I'm going to say. Ben Jones, Cedric Van Pran Granger, and David Andrews are going to rotate at guard, center, guard. Okay, so two possessions, Ced's in at center. The next two possessions, David's in. The next two possessions, Ben Jones is in. And that's what we're going to be. And then that's that right there is seven, a seven offensive lineman. My eighth offensive lineman on this group is going to be Isaiah Wynn, and he's going to be my swing player. He's going to play everywhere. I like that. I had a similar list to you, um, except I went – so I went Andrew Thomas and Stench as my two tackles. Andrew Thomas is the consensus best tackle. Absolutely. For yeah. sure. Got to put him on there. And then Broderick Jones and John Theus. That's who I went for my two tackles. Gross. You say gross. A college As a college tackle, John Theus was great. But of all the options. I went with John Theus. Okay. Is it the red hair? You know, I'm Maybe. fond of the red hair. Maybe. He makes some good coffee, too. He's got a yeah, good coffee company good going coffee on. Coffee. Yeah. Did a great interview with us. He did. Yeah. I'm just I, – I think even Theus would be like, whoa, for real? I don't know. I think that <laughs> – I would, like, when I was doing the offensive you know what, line – I'm going to text Theus after the show and be like, hey, are you a top four <laughs> tackle at Georgia? <laughs> I was thinking back my childhood, and I remember, like, John Theus. Oh, dude, just, ton of starts. Yeah. Like, ton of Super memorable. At Georgia. Oh, Started as a true freshman, was a five-star, yeah. played all four years, played a lot of football at Georgia. Yeah. So, um, not and a then bad my, choice. My other options were David Andrews, Isaiah Wynn, Ben Cleveland, and Cedric Van Pran. Yeah, mine, mine are pretty much the same. In that order. I kind of wanted to put in Clint Bowling, but – I, I think that the eight that we have here is probably the consensus that we would agree with. I like it. All right, on to the defensive side of football. I think this is where it gets really, really interesting. I think we have a variety of different answers here. Um, all right, here's how we're going to do this. Like I said earlier, two nose tackles, four defensive tackles, three defensive ends, three jacks, which are basically edge rushers, two mics, two wheels, two stars, two corner or four corners, excuse me, and four safeties. And then one specialty player of a cop-out answer had to get this guy on the roster by any and all means necessary. Damn, I hate that the chat is out here stealing my Reggie Ball jokes because, ooh, I might have had one loaded up. Um, But anyways, nose tackles. Let's start there. I think it's pretty easy. Jordan Davis, first round, overall pick right there at that spot. Yeah. And then here's what I'm going to do. Because he ultimately kicked into kind of a shade tech in, in, in pro ball, I'm going to go ahead and squeeze Richard Seymour down into a nose tackle position, and I'm, like I'm that taking one. him. I love right that. Hall of Fame player. That so, combo right there is deadly. Deadly. That's Absolutely an filthy. Combo. You got one, and one guy's going to play on third downs, yeah. Richard. So the center is going to be like, oh, I had to move the mountain for two plays, and here comes Richard Seymour <laughs> to eat my lunch. Um, all right, defensive tackle. Here's where it gets kind of hairy, in my opinion. We all know Jalen Carter's on the list. Who do you fill it out with after that? Uh, this is the one defensive position that I really struggled to think with. Um, I think Devontae Wyatt has a place in Hell this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah, he does. I think he absolutely has a conversation. So that was a name I had on my list. Um, I think, uh, it, I mean, a Pollock could kind of do I'm, well I'm, in this. I, I, in the tackle. I listed but, him as a defensive end. Yeah, I did too. Pollock is so mislabeled all the time. Pollock was a defensive end. He was six foot three, two hundred and sixty pounds. Yeah, like he, he was. Like, but. 
Yeah. What? I just, I just don't he know. He had his hand in the ground, man. He was out on the edge getting after it. I know. Every time I remember him. I know. But I'm, I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling at, like, when I did research on yeah. this today. You know how I many different websites list him as a linebacker? No, that's what I'm saying. I think, like, you could probably. huge. Like, I, I wonder what he would have done at a shade technique. Betty White. <laughs> um, <laughs> nah, probably a three tech at, at most. Yeah. Um, Ooh, um, he was never going to be heavy. Enough. I like this name from Robert. Gino, Gino. Atkins. Yeah, Gino. That's Gino's who it a, was, a, a number great, six. So, Gino's a great uh, suggestion. Here, Here's my question. John Atkins or John Jenkins? John Jenkins was the one who wore John Jenkins, John Jenkins had the season. Yeah. John Atkins had the career. Yeah, John Jenkins definitely had the season. Um, that's a tough That's a tough decision. I like the chat suggestion a little bit more, to be honest with you there. Yeah. Um, all right, so – Defensive tackle. There's there's a lot. There's not as many great options yeah. as some of these other positions. Um, like defensive end, I think defensive end is pretty easy for me. It's Pollock, it's Trayvon Walker, and it's Michael Williams. Yep, that's pretty nice. That was consensus with me. That's defensive. Nice. You, are you counting defensive end as Jack or no? No. Okay. No. Just standard defensive ends. And here's here's I think people can get confused by this. Like a defensive end body looks like Pollock and looks like Kell. Six three to six five, two sixty to two ninety. Um, 290 at its absolute peak. Like, that's like Jewish peppers. Like, you're a freak freak. Um, and you can carry that weight. But outside of that, we get any smaller and twitchier, we become edge rushers, mm -hmm. jacks, outside linebackers, right? Which is our next category that we're going to go into. I have a consensus three. I didn't even waver on a, on a third name. But um, I'm going to go ahead and rip mine because you have a, a sneaky one that apparently everyone missed. And you picked it up as well. Yeah. So, I, I guess I'm the dumb dumb. I got uh, Jarvis Jones, a.k.a. Sack Man. Yep. Um, first round draft pick at the Jack position. And then I'm going Aziz Ojolari, and I'm going Nolan Smith. Both are very solid picks. We, I think everyone's going to have Jarvis Jones, right? Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Jarvis, so, Jarvis Jones, number one. sacks, guaranteed. Yeah. I put Justin Houston at the Jack position. Oh, I'm so mad I didn't. Yeah, that, that's a great pull. That's that so is a high. great yeah. pull. People forgot oh, how good man, he was. And then for the third, I put Leonard Floyd here. Oh, huh. So I have Leonard Floyd on my list, but at a different spot. Yeah. Uh huh. Where'd you have him? I put him at Willie. Okay, that's not. Yeah. Hmm. That's, that's I I wanted. I I'll give it to you. I think he's I'll give more, it to you. I think he's more of a true Will, but I think there's just so many other players that I wanted to put before. He that. definitely. It, it, like when he played defense at Georgia, he was more so in that Jack position. Oh, Leonard Leonard stood up so much yeah. in college. Yeah. Um, as did Lorenzo. Which I, if I'm gonna force one of these, I'm going Lorenzo over over uh, Leonard. Really? Yeah. I don't know, man. Leonard Floyd. I'm a ceiling was, guy. Y'all know this. I'm a Leonard ceiling Floyd slate. was a freaking dog. Yeah, yeah but you was. gotta think. It, it, and we're still talking about a video game here. Leonard Floyd was yeah. an animal. That's right. That's right. Um, there's some options there. Yeah. There's a, a oh, consensus. Uh, Jarvis and Aziz, or just Jarvis. I'm. I don't hate Aziz there. I yeah. just put Justin Houston. I think that's. I feel like that I was one Justin of the people Houston, are gonna forget. Was Justin Houston like that at Georgia? Yes. He yeah. was. Justin Houston in 2009, I believe, like single-handedly destroyed Georgia Tech. Yeah. Sure. Say less. Um, on to our next position, which is the Mike position. I think this one's really, really easy. Uh, for me, it's Roquan and it's N'Kobe. Yeah, those are like – I the, really, yeah. really want to put Rennie Kerr in there. I do too. Yeah. I want to put Rennie there too. And if we're going to bump anybody, obviously you're bumping N'Kobe. Mm -hmm. Um and Kobe a little bit taller. Rennie so much faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, God, Rennie was so fast. He was so good. Sideline to sideline and just struck for a dude that was like five hundred ninety-five or five foot nine. <laughs> yeah, five hundred ninety-five pounds. Five hundred ninety-five pounds. <laughs> I was crazy. thinking about his power clean. Actually, there was it, that was the first athlete I remember hearing mythical things about. Rennie Curran. He's insane, dude. Yeah, I, I heard things where he was like power cleaning like three seventy, like just crazy, crazy mythical stories. Of uh, of Rennie Curry. Yeah, I, I would train him. Tremendous businessman now. Oh, he's way. awesome. Yeah. I love I, he mentored me my senior year. Sure. Another out, uh, honorable mention, Alec Ogletree. Yeah, yeah. not bad. Definitely. Oh, when he took that blocked field goal back against Don't Alabama. Don't talk about that game, man. Everybody, I mean, gosh, everybody thought that was it. That was shout it. out Noonan, Georgia. Um, shout out Xander Ogletree. Yeah. Uh, yep. Love that story. Uh, probably wanted a, a one son named Alexander had twins. Was like, fuck it, one of them's your Alex, and one of them's your Xander. <laughs> you get, um, you get the awesome. last half of your brother's name. That's <laughs> sick. <laughs> uh, I actually think they're both biologically named Alexander, mm -hmm. and one goes by Xander, and one goes by Alec. There you go. So there you go. Um, little fun facts here that may not be facts. Those are all 
mythical stories from old times past. How about the Willie position? I, I did something a little cheap here. Uh, I went ahead and already converted Thomas Davis's yeah. big ass from a safety down to a linebacker. Yeah. Um, and put him at the Willie spot next to Quay Walker. Yeah. I think I think Quay Walker and Thomas Davis are your, the best examples of like true wills. That oh just, yeah. They can still do it. They mm-hmm. can still extend outside the box and not be a liability in the yeah. passing game. I too. mean, in the four-two-five, that's what you need. So. Yeah, you need a Willie that can stretch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did Thomas Davis and Leonard Floyd. And he got to be a big Willie too. You know, what I mean, can't can't be messing with little Willies. Got yeah. got had a big Willie. Got to have the size. Yep, got to have the size. It does matter. It does onto the star position. Now I cheated here again. Um, Brandon Boykin played at a time where nickel defense wasn't really a thing. Right. But if Brandon Boykin played today. Brandon Boykin would be a hell of a star. And uh, I think Brandon Boykin would have much more success on the NFL level than he did during his career. Because, again, we just weren't playing nickel defense back in the day when Brandon Boykin was a dude. Yeah, I originally had him at cornerback. Oh, and Bullard. Yeah. Yeah, I, I originally had Brandon Boykin at cornerback. But I, I agree that he's probably – like he is the quintessential what was a star player 10 years ago before a star player was a thing. I have Sean Jones as a star player as well. I think his career at UJ is very forgotten about. It he is. was a very talented player, very talented safety. Also kind of from that era before the four two five. Sean Jones. Ah. Uh, so Sean Jones and Brandon Boykin are my two. I threw Bullard in there. Yeah. I'm looking at it right now. Uh our man Brandon Boykin measured in at five nine, hundred and eighty two pounds. It was a fourth round pick at the corner spot. Again, Brandon Boykin is playing right now. Brandon Boykin makes seventy million more dollars than he did during his career. Yeah. Oh yeah. Isn't that wild? And That's he was insane. electric on special teams. It's like the opposite of Joakim Noah. <laughs> 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 if, jo- if Joakim Noah played right now, he'd be in Greece. You know what I mean? Like you just, <laughs> you, you, your ass wouldn't play, Bubba. Um. So yeah, nah. Get ready to learn Chinese, buddy. Yeah, bro. <laughs> get, get out here learning your Mandarin, homie. Bye. Um. All right, onto the corner spot. You get four. I think there's one unanimous pick here. It's one, two, three, Champ, Champ Bailey. Bailey. Yeah. Um, and then I went DeAndre Baker, Kamari Laster, Eric Stokes. I had the That's, same. I had the exact same line. I didn't do the exact same. I had everybody except I took Tyson over Eric. I don't mind it. That's fine. I, I'm a proponent of movement skills and ball skills. And, boy, Tyson just walks circles around Eric in both departments. Eric, I – and I, we knew it was coming. Like everybody's like, "Oh, he led the team in receptions." And I would stand on here and be like, "He does not have natural hands. He mm-hmm. cannot catch the football. He panics. Like he body catches every time." And his pro day, bro. Pro day took like four off the face, like face, chest, belly, everything. Still Tough. a first round draft pick because four two seven. Like yep. it don't matter at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, just run with the guy and stick your arm up. Make sure it's not completed. <laughs> Um, but I'm I'm with you on the on the mix there with Tyson. I, it, it's it's justifiable there at the corner position. Some mentions for Jake Scott. Some mentions for Darian Kendrick. Those are solid suggestions as well. On to the safety position. Oh, shout out Asher Allen, dude. Asher Allen. <laughs> uh, Greg Blue, Malachi Starks. I'm a big fan of Richie LeCount. Um, thought he was one of my favorite yeah, players you to ever put him study. On there. I'm a mm-hmm. big Richie lover. Um, and then last but certainly not least, it's a – You're doing it on purpose. No, I'm not. I swear. You're doing it on purpose. Uh, I really do love Richie. I'm a Richie lover. Um, I love Rich. And then – Oh, dude. Someone's coming to Trenton Thompson for tackles. <laughs> so, pass. Sorry. Yeah. Didn't he – wasn't he like one of the biggest flops ever? Dude, he was the number one player in the country. Yeah. Name me a time where you thought – plays in the U.S. He had the – like the most memorable player everybody has of Trenton Thompson is him laying the Alabama player out. In yeah. The, um, like, early on in his career, too. When he, like, really early? I think that was tail end of his career. Okay, never He mind. was undrafted by the Browns. All right, so I went Greg Blue, Malachi Starks, Richard LeCount, and then because it's the ultimate team and because it's a video game, I, I, I put Kirby Smart in here. Put him on the ultimate team. Oh. Make him a backup. You know what? That's a good – Make that Joker run down on, on, on kickoff and, and never see little 16 ever again. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's actually – I completely forgot Kirby Smart, like, played football. <laughs> just completely yeah, straight up. I'm I went jug- with the I'm jug- but no, it, that it, that would be fun to like have Kirby Smart in your ultimate team. I went with all the heavy hitters. I had Malachi, but then I went Bakari Rambo, Lewis C, and Greg Blue. We just gonna mess some stuff up. That's back there. literally the exact same. That, we I just had. gonna f-, f some people up Lewis in the C- secondary. Lewis C play- playing with Lewis C would be so fun to play with. Oh yeah, I'm trying to find the year, but 
there was a football game against Auburn where Bakari Rambo had like three personal fouls. Like lay hit out of bounds on the road. I was there and I was like, you know what? Bakari Rambo couldn't play for me. You know? But then again, you 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 slow Bakari Rambo down, you tell him not to kill people yeah. on the football field, and he's probably not Bakari Rambo. Another one of these guys, not huge. Probably wouldn't do well in today's college football. Sean yeah. Williams. That's a good shout. Sean Williams was also a heavy hitter. Dog. <laughs> Bakari I, Rambo I, would be a smoke Monday in today's college football. Every time you turn the TV on, like, damn, smoke Monday just got ejected from yeah. the game again. <laughs> That's a great comp for Bakari Rambo. <laughs> smoke Monday. Um, Underrated I'm, ball I'm hawk to too. The actual year here because I was I was frustrated. You're probably th- <laughs> it was probably if it's it's probably 2010. I found, I found it here. It was it's 2010. 2010. That was that was that chippy game between the when Cam oh, Newton. That was when Nick Fairley yeah. was stepping on Aaron Murray. Yeah. That was a chippy game and Georgia led for a good bit of it. I'm trying to look at it right here. Yep, Georgia had 10 penalties in that football game. I believe it. Checks out. What was the final score, like 45 to 31? 49-31. Not bad for you there, kid. All right, um, on to our last category, which is the the cheating category. We can't go an ultimate roster without having this guy. My answer, Charlie Trippy. Can't have a Georgia ultimate team without the the legend, Charlie Trippy. Man fought a war. I mean, come on. (laughs) I like it. Go ahead. I'd, I this one was just personal because it, it it feels like it was wrong not to have him anywhere on this list. I personally selected Sony Michelle just because mm. it didn't feel right to not have him on the running back list. But there's also like had to put no Sean on mine, but I still have to have Sony Michelle. Can't have too many backs. Now we didn't really have a position for this guy, but Ooh. to see him on the field and to see him in video game form would be so much fun. Rodrigo Blankenship. <laughs> Dude, to see, tell me, tell me that the specs would not be fun to. Specs would be dope. There's some uh, some Boss Bailey love. Y'all trying to get to my heart right there. Boss, Boss Bailey, underrated bro, athlete. Boss Bailey, greatest athlete of all time. I think we talked to Terrence about this. Yeah. Boss Bailey, one of the freakiest human beings yeah. to ever walk the planet. Um. So yeah, great, great stuff there. Um. Great stuff from this network this week as well. Shouts out to Dan Lanning one more time. Dan Lanning, give him three. Um, so yeah, shouts out to this network. Shouts out to you guys for listening and hanging out with us all off season. Hey, last or this Tuesday's show, over thirty seven minutes of average viewer retention rate. Ooh, hell and yeah! And I only say these things because it's a testament to you guys. Y'all love this show. Y'all show up, you show out, and you stick. It's very very sticky what we do around here. So make sure you're sharing some of that sticky icky with your friends. I'll see you Monday. Oh, that was a little. That was close. It's close.